I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to this uh, another special edition of I Mix What I Like Live right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball, your host. Very happy to be here uh, right out the gate. Welcome to everybody. And please do like, share, subscribe, join the channel if possible. And uh, if you're here live, uh, please, uh, first of all, good morning and greetings. But please go ahead and, and get out there on Twitter and, and uh, tag Black Power Media and, and uh let folks know that this is happening. Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion and um, one I'm always looking forward to and got a little new twist on uh, my approach to talking about Dr. King this morning. So I uh, much, very much look forward to it to those who will hear and see this later on all your favorite podcast uh, platforms and outlets. Welcome and peace to you as well. And uh, share it with somebody now. Uh, Tag somebody, put it on all your social medias, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, good morning to Lisa, Tony. Uh, Tony, I answered your, I think I, I think it was you put a, uh, you had a YouTube comment wanting uh, evidence uh, that I was citing during a, our brief exchange with Brother Kaba the other day. Uh, so check the, the, the show notes to all of those uh to that show and i think you'll find um at least what i was working from again uh you know my general argument remains we um can all find headlines and articles uh to share and i'm not convinced any of us are properly uh situated to assess it uh so but i have my you know but i put it there so you know um so good morning and definitely check that out kd to you as well leah greetings peace peace rozel Bo. <laughs> uh is that a hold up hold up hold up tony is that a is that a fushnikins is that a fushnikins reference <laughs> oh, wasn't you? My bad, Tony. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. What, who, who, if anybody was asking for it, please, please check the show notes. Tafari, peace. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Sugar Booger. Oh, wow. Compton, Compton in the building. Greetings to you. And thanks for joining us this early. Appreciate you. Ricky, peace to you in the African world as well. Phillies in the building. Good morning, greetings. Always good to see you all. And free Mumia. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Saludos también, Deborah. Saludos. All right. So uh, before we get uh, to to to, there is one thing that I just saw this morning, and I don't even I don't have any thoughts on it. Well, I mean, obviously. Just a, just a, it, it almost doesn't need any words, but just to sort of give us that little caffeine shot. <laughs> this is actually a week old, and I'm just now seeing the story. It was apparently reported on the 11th. Uh, journalist Ida B. Wells is commemorated with a Barbie doll for her fearless activism. I really, I really don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, 
but uh yeah so anyway i just saw that uh just thought we would um and i'll let you all decide you all could tell me because you all get more upset than i do when we when we delve into to, to the less than serious topics i actually have a kind of serious take on all of it but uh maybe we'll come back to it this that is Tariq Nasheed has jumped in to the uh YouTube beef with the F Fresh and Fit brothers. And I'm mad that I know about it. I'm not proud that I know about it. I got caught up in in several of the rabbit holes I've been going down lately. I'm sorry, but there is something I think of value as it as it relates to pan African politics, but we can maybe take a poll if we want to come back to that at at the end of everything um you know it's wild now there is one thing i do want to start off with this morning that before we get to the king piece because um uh the other rabbit hole i've been going down a lot lately obviously for those who follow this show and this channel is the cryptocurrency piece uh um isaiah jackson or bitcoin zay uh and his crew at i think it's f bitcoin fridays the podcast have said they want to debate me uh since they've they've seen that the apparently the video i did critiquing isaiah jackson or bitcoin zay's uh book bitcoin in black america so stay tuned uh and it's interesting i mean it feels and it's interesting that 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 i have a, a little clip i want to show regarding that this morning uh not him and them but regarding the topic because uh and i want to take some time and enjoy watching this this you know 10 or 11 minute clip with you so if it's something you know you don't want anything you know go ahead and just just go get another cup of coffee take your bathroom break and come back in about 10 minutes uh i'll definitely be uh time stamping this video so that people who just want to get to the king piece later can can skip right on ahead but um the responses that i've been getting so so isaiah jackson tweeted the other day that he that you know uh he has seen what apparently is mine and the first video or public critique of his book and um since tweeting it out and and i you know and he said you know some you know tagged me and said you know you should come on our platform and i said anytime i said you know i reached out to you already um uh i think he knows that through a mutual friend and and some history that i've interviewed uh his now fiance uh, morgan maxwell and her great work which is still at i mix what i like dot org uh regarding race and particularly black women and how they are negatively impacted by social media um uh but anyway my point was i you know i think he I, you know I, what i said publicly was like i i can't remember exactly what i said but the point was i've reached out to you i think you know uh so hit me up and we'll definitely set that up i'm happy to do it and i do just generally think you know, we need more discussion and debate, even around the issue of vaccine, where I admit I'm a hypocrite at this point or contradicting myself yet again, because I don't want to do it. We need to do it, but I don't know how to do it. And and without. And maybe the crypto thing is going to be the same thing, because uh, and this is the point I'm getting at, is that a lot of the responses that were coming and they weren't I'm not, you know, don't you know, it's not a lot, but if it started to feel uh, like a low level uh version of the one time i bumped into the beyonce beyonce bay be, bay hive um where the responses were uh you know all you know his 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 team so to speak uh condemning me um and not with specificity or detail just saying things like i don't know anything about investment i don't understand the technology apparently there is the one specific thing that somebody did say is that the underlying um uh the companies that i've argued are gateways um i forgot their names now there were two that i pointed to that are gateways to the blockchain technology one person did respond and i appreciated this much with specific saying that that was uh, true for access to one coin, but not Ethereum that I think has its own. But as I'll get to the issue of concentration is still the same. 
So uh, um, uh, I've read a new another new report on it. I'm going to show you in just a minute, and then, but I want to. But but my real point is is that um, much like the Bayhive feeling, there is there is as is going to be discussed in this clip. I'm going to show you a little bit of a of a kind of uh, cult ish type thing happening. So a lot of the responses I got that one notwithstanding, because I appreciate specific, although it did kind of the rest of the tweet was kind of like, it's more or less like I'm an idiot. Uh, but here's one specific reason why. So at least I appreciated that. But the rest of them were just kind of like, you don't know what you're talking about. Da, 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 da. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be a tough day for me in the debate, all that kind of stuff. So it may be, you know, maybe. Um, I will say that if the answer to my argument exists, that is, if there is a checkmate to my argument that exists, it's not in Brother Jackson's book. So that would be, you know, if there, you know, obviously that's an intro. He knows a lot more. They know a lot more. So, but, but they didn't put it in, it's not been put in any of the two full length books I've read or any of the dozens of articles at this point or hundreds of hours at this point of video that I've been watching lately on it. So too much. I admit it's just too much. It's too much. Oh, a couple years ago, after that Super Bowl performance, and I put a, I just tweeted a picture, a, a split screen that's, that had Asada over here and Beyonce over here. And I said, because all everybody was talking about Beyonce as a revolutionary hero and representing the Panthers and all that, so I said, if Beyonce is a hero, then what is Asada? Or no, it wasn't a hero; it was a, a revolutionary. Beyonce is a revolutionary. Then what is Asada? One has a fifty million dollar Pepsi deal. One has a, 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 an increased warrant put on her after having to escape prison and live in exile. <laughs> so I was just like, and they. It was it was too much. That was the one time where it was for real. Like it was like I really got the full thing, and it was too much. Uh, so I get it, and I do also, by the way, get it when it comes to this issue of of Bitcoin and crypto, and many of the other, but not quite the same way, but but similar to the other political positions I and we on this platform take. That is. Well, I know for a fact when we did the book on um, Manning Marable's Malcolm X, I know for a fact that uh, there were people who explicitly told me and Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, I agree with your argument. I just don't want to be publicly associated with it. So, you know, that it doesn't help your career to take those positions. It doesn't it doesn't invite you into the popular crowd circles and that it does invite in some cases some some uh you know herd mentality put differently and pun intended um responses that are often not pleasant and not reflective of your humanity or your full body of work <laughs> so i get it i could see why people wouldn't want to open up their twitter and see all these these messages and tags saying you're an idiot some Bitcoin enthusiast cussed me out on Twitter the other day. I'm not even that aggressive. I'm not calling anybody names. Somebody's up there, F you this, F you that. And I'm like, mm. Mm. So I get why people don't want to do it. But he but this is but this is what I think is going on. Now again, this is this is becoming one of my favorite channels. Uh, although this is his partnership with another uh, uh, colleague. So this is from The Drip, which is a, a, a combination of um, Coffeezilla, which is the channel I like, and and, and this other uh, uh, brother from somewhere. But, um, but check this out. Just check this out. If you're in the crypto game, you knew Bitcoin conference was happening for sure. You knew, and you, he got the tickets, and he flew to he flew to Miami. And, then, and this is from last summer you know for the I'm Bitcoin having... conference. Guys, we've got to talk more. about the Bitcoin conference because I thought it was very revealing. Okay. Yeah, because okay, at its core, let's ask each other, what is Bitcoin? Right? Let's let's do some investigation today. 
talking about the Bitcoin conference, what is Bitcoin? Is it a currency? Is it a revolutionary financial uh, uprising? Or is it perhaps Whoa. A, a cult? Cult? You're going cult on it? I wasn't sure where you're going to go. I thought you were going to go scam, but you're saying well, cult. Okay. You know, no, no, no. I'm just, let's just watch, okay? I, I'm saying it may have become, it may have started as a Satoshi Nakamoto's little pet project idea. Yeah. It is now full blown cult. Amish. Do you know what the Bitcoin maximalists are, by the way? Oh my God, the maximal. See, that's a cult. Maximalist. Just the name itself is cult. I want to show. I want to show the people this. There's th several clips good. I want to show you. Just reviewing the Bitcoin conference, boys. So this is uh the Bitcoin com, com uh Bitcoin conference in Miami. This is M Max Kaiser. He's one of the big influencers. <laughs> Did I not tell you yes, it's all dubstep? You can already hear it. You can already like dubstep. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! We're not done! We're not done! <laughs> Fuck Elon! <laughs> Fuck Elon! <laughs> Dude, that's the other thing. They're so mad about Elon Musk. <laughs> he said, Fuck Elon. Like, yeah. because, that's rude. That's rude. This, this guy is How out of much control, cocaine do you think this guy okay. railed before showing up there? Ah! Yeah! This is what I'm thinking too. about when anyone tells me about Bitcoin. And by the way, I own Bitcoin. You know, a lot of people do. And if you own a little bit of Satoshi and you don't act like this, to me, you're not in Bitcoin anymore. You're like, <laughs> you it. own it, but you're not like. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're not singing the it. praises. You're not in the you're cult. You're not so you can God is own great. Bitcoin and not be a part of this. <laughs> and I just want to make that clear. So let, let us know in chat. Are you part of this? You part of this clan? We're not done. <laughs> We're not done. <laughs> Fuck Elon. Oh Fuck Elon. <laughs> and again, why I like this channel so much is that it, it's, 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 I, I mean, it's good quality production, I think, and all that kind of stuff. And there's some good humor there. But, but really what has drawn me to the channel is that this guy, as he said, he's, he's, he's in investments. He's a stock guy. He's, he's a capitalist. He is a, a, a free marketeer. He is, but he's one of those purists in the sense that the purpose of his channel is to expose the hustles the pump and dump schemes, the the cons, the the ripoffs, uh, who's one of those, I love the free market so much that I hate when people negatively, you know, it, it, it mess with it uh, type thing. So so there's a level of, a, 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 I don't know, an honesty that I that I get along with some good analysis. I mean, they're having fun here, but these guys are, are smart and, and uh, know how this stuff works. Um, but anyway, and Max Kaiser is a name again. I used to watch him all the time on RT, and again, I thought he offered a fun alternative way to get mainstream mainstream economic news. He was not a radical. He is not. He is not a revolutionary. And yet, I hear his name more and more now through Bitcoin and from black discussants of Bitcoin and crypto than ever. And it's 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 crazy. So that's why I'm enjoying this so much. For one reason. Uh, that's day one. Amish, that is day is that one. Opening hit? Is that, that's the opening hitter? That's the opening, opening hit. hitter. Off, off rip, dude. I like he that. He hits you like with that. that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. You know what? You got to come it's in strong, a, right? A, you got to come in strong. Oh, oh, right? It's a call. Yeah, they're crazy. Come on. He's crazy. Well, well, do you have the video? Like, you're showing me a great video of him just screaming at the reporter. Yeah, I I'm going to show that in a second. Yeah, I'm going to show that in a second. I going to hit that reporter. But he's he is like, he could hit someone kind of vibe. He could go crazy and just punch someone in the face and say, "Hey, I'm crazy. It's, we gotta go." How yeah. dare you? He could hit someone. If you talk mess about Lowe's Bitcoin, money. Max Kaiser is coming for you. Especially this yeah. man up, is Max on another Kaiser. level. This guy says, "I have five dollars of Bitcoin." <laughs> yeah, who do you think these guys are talking about? Like, I feel like these guys probably own like thousands of Bitcoin, and so for them, if Bitcoin goes up five percent, they make like ten million dollars. For the rest yeah. of us mere mortals, we're like, Dude, I have a thousand dollars. Can you relax? Like, I have a, like, what, like, a couple thousand maybe, you know, or you have you have five hundred dollars in Bitcoin, whatever you have. 
you don't have life changing money. So you're not invested like these guys are. You can always tell who has a lot of Bitcoin by their, if they've got cocaine energy levels, <laughs> yeah. they've got a lot of Bitcoin. This guy has a is lot of Bitcoin. Is this what it's like to just make a bunch of free money? Like, is it, is there also like, if you scam someone and you just see a hundred thousand dollars in your bank account, is that like cocaine? Is that like it's you see them be. with zeros and you're like, woo, yeah. <laughs> No, I think, I think you see that and then you go buy Welcome your cocaine. Anthony D. With and then you buy the cocaine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah. well, fine. Fair. Either way. And then I guess the cocaine makes you do the... Does it? I've heard it's not productive at all. You know that you guy watches Wolf of Wall Street. People are saying that in chat. I, I totally agree. Patrick Bateman says he probably watches Wolf of Wall Street every week. That's so true. Right, right. Yeah. That's the training videos. Dude, they use those as training videos. <laughs> all those so, scam calls they do like they do training yes. videos of that. and it's like they're scamming a guy it's like remember that penny stocks call oh. he's like just scamming a guy Dude, there's like sales guy. there's like sales companies they're like okay let's right. watch it look at what he's doing that's, look Ka- that's max kaiser max kaiser that's sees max that kaiser. and he goes what an inspiration what so i've got another clip of max <laughs> kaiser dude this guy's incredible you should so, all wow. watch max i am a fan <laughs> of max don't let it get, <laughs> get it twisted this? This man's the greatest thing to happen to Bitcoin since Satoshi himself. Let's be honest. He yeah, took yeah. it from a currency and he made it a religion, dude. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Let's check. <laughs> let's watch this together, dude. Let me, let me explain something to you right now. Okay, here's a $10 bill. This is garbage. This is garbage. Your people in South Africa, <laughs> you have your RAN, right? That's Iran, going to zero. Iran. That's going to zero. <laughs> this is going to zero, too. Euros are going to zero. The yen's going to zero. The Chinese wow. currency is going to zero. Bro. What? He's a wild Guruji. He's, he's like, cracked he's like, he's out, like the dude. leader of the community. He <laughs> almost reminds you of Guruji. <laughs> he's gacked out, dude. He's, 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 he's silly. He's messed up. But he's, he's going dude, to zero, he's too. To Euros attention. are going to zero. The yen's going to zero. The Chinese currency is going to zero. It's all <laughs> going to zero against Bitcoin. If you don't understand that yet, you're going to be impoverished. You're going to be on the street. You're going to be begging. You're going to be out of business. You're going to be toast. Max, do you know that it's a, a criminal offense to tear up? Do you know that with the Bitcoin I have, I can buy any freaking senator or congressman I want? I make the laws. He who has the Bitcoin makes the laws, Rand. We're, we're not going to just sit around and let the goddamn congressman tell us what to do. We've got the capital. We make the laws. We've got the Bitcoin. They we don't. we got it. They don't. Do you understand? Wow. This guy's like, uh, yeah, no, this guy knows how to get attention. Like, look at he's making a no, show. No, he believes dude, this. In this. You can see it in his eyes. This he is believes. a true believer. He's a believer, and dude, anything this is anything for crypto. Freaking true believer. Look at this. Look at this. He's look a true this. believer, look and he this. said he said the whole world look must believe. The whole world must believe, and then he dude. he makes it viral. This is like a this is a good viral video. Have moment. you seen Heaven's Gate? Have you seen the Heaven's Gate? <laughs> Do you all remember Heaven's like, Gate? Where this guy's oh, talking. I've seen a bunch of those videos. Like, there's a documentary like, about it, right? It's cycle. We're not saying that planet Earth. Like that this is the same guy. Well, this, this, this guy, guy this, this guy is the out. same. He ran a cult where everyone killed himself. Yeah, he ran a cult. Yeah, he's the same as this guy. This guy is the same as this oh, guy. Man. Just You're better go, camera. Same thing. Look at this same dude. thing. But this guy's he at goes, least just trying goes, to get I money. Can, he goes, I control the laws. No, I know he's that's not, he's okay. Not just, that's he's rude. not just money. That's he's rude. he's he's power tripping. He's power tripping. That's where he went rude on it. Where he said, "I'll buy the, I'll buy and sell every what senator." You're gonna buy the government? <laughs> and the government? They're nothing. I you feel know, like the, to this me. guy, this guy does that's it like he he's like Bitcoin's the only government, dude. I only respect yeah. the Bitcoin government. Until he said that, I was like, you know what? This guy believes in himself. Yeah. He wants to make it happen. He's working hard. He wants to make a little publicity statement, whatever. But then as soon as he goes into that hateful shit where he goes, I'll buy and sell the whole country. The whole country will be mine. You're nothing. Like, it's like, okay, calm down now. Now you're being rude. Now you're being like, a, like, like, I'm going to own you. Psycho you piece of shit. He, this guy's psycho. He's, he's zero. It's all going to zero against Bitcoin. I love how this guy you just know? like casually mentions on TV. Like you could be a bro and just not mention it. Like, even if you know, hey, this is a federal offense you're doing, you don't have to tell them on air, hey, you know. So, so this is actually, so this is, this is actually good. I'm glad that word, word from the point put this, made this point. The USD, the US dollar is a fiat currency, and every fiat currency in history is returned to zero in value. To the extent that's true, and we don't know that that's true in terms of today's fiat currencies, the, particularly the dominant ones like the yen, the dollar, the pound. Uh, um, but no, but but 
and I'm not here to defend fiat currency or capital at all, but but the key difference here, and note the key difference that a lot of the crypto world is missing. Max is saying it's going to go to zero in the face of Bitcoin. In, in other words, that Bitcoin is going to replace all of these fiat currencies. So that's one fallacy or, or um, unsupported by history prediction, unsupported by current data prediction. Uh, that even if it were true, two does not answer the fundamental point I keep raising, which is how, even if it does become the dominant currency in the world, does that fact change the maldistribution or the inequality or the expropriation and exploitation of the wealth that that then comes to represent? And that's a key difference that I don't be that I don't hear being heard in all of this defense, which is why I like what these guys here are doing is because it's more honest. They're not proposing it as a solution to the world. In fact, quite the opposite. They're saying if you get in and know how to make good investments, you might make some money if you have money to invest, which black people don't. You might make some money, but most of it is not going to happen that way. Most that's not what even if there is a full on adoption of Bitcoin as currency, it's not going to to change in levels of inequality. All it's going to do is make those who hold the Bitcoin currently more rich. And I'm going to come to that in a minute after this clip. But let's let's come back to that. Like their cops are probably going to get arrested for that, right? Like that, that's rude. You're going to be out of business. You're going to be toast. Max, do you know that it's a, a criminal offense? Like he get, he wants right. him to confess here. This he is wants confession to confess, time. But, to tear but up. he needed he needed this. Max needed this because now he goes into the real rip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I know. How would he go into the real rip? Do you know that with the Bitcoin I have, I can buy any freaking senator or congressman i want i make the laws he who has the bitcoin makes the laws Rand. we're, we're wow. not going to just sit around and let the goddamn congressman tell us what to do yeah, we've yeah. got the capital yes. we make the part of me just gets hyped when i see this guy i'm like yes max yeah he believes he believes I'm in get, something i'm gonna buy some more bitcoin i gotta go buy yeah, you the bitcoin. hold on selling my house real quick that's what I mean. Do you need cocaine? You need to get jacked up. You need I'm, to I'm get excited, some Bitcoin, dude. dude. You need to get a ton of Bitcoin to where you, if it moves up 1%, you never have to work again. That's wow. what you need. Yeah. That's how much he has. Eh? He has a lot of Bitcoin and he's saying it's here to stay. Oh. You think Bitcoin a bunch of nonsense. Is that what you're saying? What do you, what do you say? What's your take on it? Is no, it no, Bitcoin's nonsense? not nonsense, but it's, it's a, no. it's a, um, asset like anything else that needs to be judged on its own merit. Look, there's a price where Bitcoin makes sense. There's a price where Bitcoin doesn't make sense, right? Like, yeah, it's what they are driving up a bubble. They're driving up a bubble. They're trying to bubble. They're they're bubbling. They're well, bubbling. It depends. They're to bubble. I mean, it depends on adoption. But but the idea that what these people say is they'll go like, we're gonna create financial freedom for everyone with Bitcoin. Well, no. Even if Bitcoin goes to a zillion dollars, only the people who have some Bitcoin are gonna be financially free. They have this idea that like somehow if you adopt Bitcoin, everyone's money problems are going to be gone. Like everyone's just suddenly going to be rich. It's like, okay, yeah, that's no. not how the world works. No, that's There's not how it works. There's going to be just like, as many poor thing. people and nothing, none of your silly made up currency can change that. I'm not saying it's not a good idea to go to crypto. I think it is. I believe in the technology, yeah. but the idea that you can never value these things or look at them objectively, it's like, it's stupid. Look at this guy. He literally, I mean, speaking of a cult, He's basically yeah, swearing someone in here. Look, wild. he's like doing a priest service. Permission! I choose to accept Satoshi into my heart! I choose to accept Satoshi into my heart. Thank you! You are saved, brother. That's what he goes. Watch that wow. again. Permission! I choose to accept Satoshi into my heart! You are saved! Thank you! Yee! <laughs> People I are... love these guys. <laughs> I get it. I get away. it. It's kind of a joke. But then there's this le le like layer to it where you're like, oh, this isn't a complete joke to these people. He's making money. He has the Bitcoin. He has like he he benefits from the bubble. He benefits from the bubble. Yeah. I mean, it, it is like that bubble thing you were talking about with GameStop and shit, where they're all like, we're gonna be rich. We're gonna be rich. It's like you all can't get rich. Yeah. As you start taking the money out, yeah. the value goes down, and then ninety percent of you don't make any money. Yeah. Hmm. What are you thinking? Yeah. I kind of like that track, though. I'm a scammer, scammer. I don't know if that is that an actual track or did he make that up? I don't know. I'll find out when I get a copyright hit on this video. <laughs> All right. So, so that's that was the fun part.
there is uh, a little bit of depth to, to this that I, uh, a little more depth at least that I'd want to bring up. Whoops, we'll get to that just momentarily. Um, this is this is the one I want us to start with this morning because, um, I mean, I do keep trying to learn. I mean, and and maybe too much because I'm 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 not. I'm not overly excited about the topic and I'm not thrilled that I'm spending this much time on it, but um, I don't see any, I don't see it being dealt with anywhere else. And I keep looking for, even the critiques aren't criticizing it from the perspective. So that's why, again, shout out to BPM and what we're doing here. So click like, share, subscribe, and join. Thank you very much. <laughs> but um Anyway, this this uh, article. So first of all, the, 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 it was reported uh, in Fortune and Wall Street Journal and elsewhere that uh, this this report. So I wanted to read the report um, directly uh, from its, you know, from the source itself, um, because um, it's being reported in in in. I mean, the, the quick headlines uh, are pretty startling. But um, in fact, let me let me do it that way. Let me start with the headline, and then I'll come back to the actual study itself. Uh, the The headline: um, A new study from the National Bureau of Economic Research reveals that a minuscule group of investors control more of the supply of Bitcoin. Researchers found that 0.01% of of the cryptocurrency's holders control 27% of the supply. The study said 10,000 Bitcoin accounts hold 5 million out of the 19 million coins in circulation or, or the equivalent of about $232 billion. An estimated 114 million accounts hold Bitcoin worldwide, according to Crypto.com. That's more concentrated wealth than, 1%, than the 1% of affluent Americans who currently control about one third of U.S. dollars, a figure that many pointed to as an indicator of massive inequality. So again, uh, the... the I, I get it. It's Fortune magazine that I'm reading from. I get it. So people want to say they're defenders of the fiat world and whatever. OK, but. Then I would just need to have this explained to me from someone who says that this is flawed. And one of the things that I wanted to look at is how did they methodologically make this conclusion? Because as I know, Bitcoin defenders will argue it's hard to determine who holds what because the the wallets are anonymous or pseudonymous the the uh you know people hold one account may hold the coins of many people um many people may one person may own many accounts so how do you how do you know but initially just off of this though um and the in the report they're referencing addresses all of that, and I'll show you in just a minute. But the 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 point is that the crypto and Bitcoin defenders, in particular, argue that this is what's going to redistribute wealth. This is what's going to be revolutionary for poor people and black people. But it's and and it's going to decentralize the banking and and the you know the 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 intermediaries and yet there's more concentration in bitcoin ownership than in ownership of the us dollar which they say is going to be replaced by bitcoin and i'm saying so okay should that happen this handful of people will have all the money and all the the the, the power if in fact i am wrong and an economic power has to come first and political power can't be organized from an organized mass movement or i should say political power can't if i'm wrong and, and political power cannot be derived from an organized mass movement and only through economics, then the same handful of people who own all the Bitcoin will have all the money anyway. Similarly, in terms of mining, uh, well, first of all, as it shows here, 90% of Bitcoin transactions are not the result of users buying something with the currency, but rather transactions between a single user's own crypto account. So they're just sending money to each, to moving coins from one account to another to make it harder to trace and harder to measure, um, but they're not using it as a medium of exchange. 
Of the remaining 10% of transactions, the report said less than 3% of them are linked to illegal transactions, scams, or gambling. That's supported by the CIA study that we, we covered here a few weeks ago. Most of Bitcoin is not used for illegal activity, um, which is why the CIA is using, saying it could be used, Bitcoin, the, the currency tra tracing itself and blockchain, the underlying technology, the CIA is saying it can use for greater levels of surveillance than they currently have now. And they're saying so more people should, they're, they're saying we, meaning the state and its associates should engage in crypto and Bitcoin because it's not this illegal playground. Uh, um, uh, and and most of the criminals who would have been using it have left block uh, Bitcoin and blockchain the blockchain because as the CIA was reporting they now know they're being they can be monitored there so they're finding other avenues to do their illegal activity so Bitcoin to those who are supporting it in its growth and its investment in this point we agree it's not a it's not a playground for the the so-called criminal world it is itself a criminal activity and a Ponzi scheme and another Wall Street hustle uh or being turned into one very quickly uh you know, that allows for, you know, like the late John Judge used to say, you can't have organized crime without organized police. The, the, anyway, the bulk of the, that 10% is linked to transactions between different types of exchanges and trading desks that represent institutional investors, the report says. So, the, so it's just it, it, institutional investors, the big wigs, the dominant exchanges, Binance, Coinbase, et cetera. They're making all the money off of the movement of the coins, but it's not being used to purchase anything. And it's certainly not going from rich people to poor people. Early investors in Bitcoin have reaped tremendous benefits if they held on to the cryptocurrency priced at around $5,000 per, per, $5, per coin in March 2020. Uh, the famously volatile digital currency reached as high as 68000 in November, according to Coindesk. I think it's just slightly around under $40,000 now. Okay. So anyway, the, the, again, the headline being there's greater degree of concentration in ownership of the coin of Bitcoin specifically than the U.S. dollar, despite claims by its defenders that it's going to to decentralize and free everything up. So in this blockchain analysis of the Bitcoin market by Igor Makarov and Antoinette Shore, uh, the first, the, the, the former being from the London School of Economics and the latter from the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, <clears throat> excuse me, they published this report in October of 2021. Uh, I've highlighted just a few points. I have, I think I've put the link in the show notes to, to where you can find it, but uh, if not, I'll make sure it gets put there. Um, a distinguishing feature of cryptocurrencies is the promise of a decentralized system of payments or store of value outside the traditional nexus of government scrutiny. The blockchain technology at the heart of, the, of cryptocurrencies replaces the reliance on a few centralized record keepers, such as banks or credit card networks with a large set of decentralized and anonymous agents. OK, so that's. That's what the claim is, that the blockchain technology at the heart of cryptocurrencies replaces the reliance on a few centralized record keepers, such as banks or credit card networks. Now, again, I'm arguing that that centralized network of record keepers is being replaced by a centralized network of uh, exchanges and trading platforms and wallets owned again by a handful of already billionaires uh, who have made more money during the pandemic, as is the case with Brian Armstrong, who owns Coinbase or runs Coinbase. Certainly the, um, uh, I forgot, what is his nickname? YZ or CZ. Uh, the owner of Binance, who's now said to be worth almost a hundred billion dollars. I mean, you know, so again, not a fan of the banks, just not seeing a difference. Uh, so what they've done, they've done here is that uh, we first document that 90 percent of transaction volume on the Bitcoin blockchain is not tied to economically meaningful activities, but is the byproduct of the Bitcoin protocol design, as well as the preference of many participants for anonymity. Because the Bitcoin blockchain is a public ledger, all payment flows between addresses are perfectly observable. Therefore, many Bitcoin users adopt strategies designed to impede the tracing of Bitcoin flows by moving their funds over long chains of multiple addresses and splitting payments among them, resulting in a large amount of, of, of spurious volume. 
So again, a lot of the, the, the claimed volume on these platforms is just people moving their money from one to another. It's not an actual exchange taking place. We show that the vast majority of Bitcoin transactions between real entities are for trading and speculative purposes. And again, I just, you know, this is my point. Uh, starting from 2015, 75%, 75% of real Bitcoin volume has been linked to exchanges or exchange-like entities such as online wallets, OTC desks, and large institutional traders. In contrast, other known entities are only responsible for a minor part of the volume. For example, illegal transaction scams and gambling together make up less than 3% of volume. The fraction of volume explained by miners is even smaller. Exchanges not only generate the most volume, but they are the most connected nodes to the Bitcoin network. So again, Binance, Coinbase are already the dominant blockchain user users. A proof of work protocol like Bitcoin requires a majority of decentralized miners to be honest for its record keeping function to work. So this is a point actually that was not raised in the articles I read about this report, which I think is interesting and even more or another level of a problem. Um, the mining issue. So, so yes, there's a con consolidation of mining. But look at what it says is an issue with that. If a single miner or set of colluding miners were to command a majority of the mining power in the network, the ledger could become controlled by the colluding group and result in the infamous 51% attack in which the group can alter the previously verified records. The possibility of such attacks creates systemic risks for financial stability and potentially even for national security if a large fraction of citizen uses if a large fraction of citizens uses Bitcoins as a store of value. So as the Bitcoin promoters argue, there are three stages historically that money is supposed to go through before it becomes money as we know it. One, it's just something that people find of interest. They think it's pretty, they think it's neat, they start to collect it, and that's it. Then it becomes a store of value in that, wait a minute. So as the example often with gold, first gold is like, oh, it's a pretty this, it's pretty that, let me keep it, I'm gonna hold on to it. It's a, it's a collectible. Then as they argue, it goes to a store of value. Wait a minute, I can get that cow over there for, a pound of gold. I'm going to hold on to the gold. It stores value. And I'm going to, you know, once enough people adopt it as a store of value and then say and start accepting it as, okay, I can use it to buy a cow. I can use it to buy a fish. I can use this amount to buy a house. I can use this amount to buy whatever. Then it becomes an actual full blown currency. At this point, as the Bitcoin advocates argue, it's just now entering into the stage of becoming a store of value. It's gone from the stage of, oh, this is cute. Let me collect it. Now it's being seen as having some value. It can buy a couple of things. It can have some value. You can sell it for, for US dollars or, or another currency. Hmm. Now they're arguing with more adoption in time, it will get to the level of an actual currency. But as this is showing you, is arguing here, despite the claims of the anonymity and the, the encryption and the protection and the this and the that, the safety you get, unlike in a bank, which is federally protected <laughs> and insured. Um, and if you, if you just Google it, this is one of the concerns for people in the Bitcoin or the crypto community, this 51% attack, because what it's saying is that uh, miners can... And our, it's, it says here, it relies on them to be honest for record keeping. If a single miner or colluding miners were to command a majority and get to the 51% of the mining that's going on, they can then apparently rewrite and mess with the ledger and mess with the, and start messing with the records and start saying, no, you didn't have your coins in your wallet. They were in my wallet.
It is therefore important to understand how concentrated the mining capacity is. The previous literature is mainly focused on mining pool concentration. By design, the probability of mining a block and obtaining a block reward in the Bitcoin blockchain is proportional to the hash hashing power spent on mining. This provides strong incentives for miners to pool their computing power and co-insure each other. As a consequence, mining in the Bitcoin blockchain is dominated by mining pools. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first study that accurately links miners to their mining pools. We show that the Bitcoin mining capacity is highly concentrated and has been for the last five years. The top five, the top 10 percent of miners control 90 percent and just 0.1 percent, about 50 miners control control close to 50 percent of mining capacity. Furthermore, this concentration of mining capacity is counter cyclical and varies with the Bitcoin price. It decreases following sharp increases in the Bitcoin price and increases in periods when the price drops. Thus, the risk of a 51% attack increases in times when the Bitcoin price drops precipitously or following the halving events. And then it notes that a large majority of mining pools are registered in China, though it does not automatically mean that the miners have to be located there. So again, I don't, I, I will not pretend to fully understand and be an expert on all of this, but it just sounds again, more like, again, issues of concentration, issues of lack of privacy, an issue of what we need to trust people to not engage in a 51% attack on the blockchain and start rewriting the, the ledger or the, the, you know, the, the scripts. It sounds like, and in, in other words, it sounds like something that should be discussed more among those who are touting this as a solution to all of our problems. From a public policy perspective, it is important to understand who is positioned to benefit most from any price appreciation that would happen if regulators allow a broad adoption of Bitcoin. Are these a select few investors or the general public? So as the two fellas with CoffeeZilla and the drip we're talking about. If we all adopt Bitcoin and buy our um, uh, 1 million Satoshis for about 500 US dollars, as Hill Harper tells us, uh, I'll, you know, individually, we would be worth about 500 US dollars, but the people who own Bitcoin the, the well, their stock their value of their coins goes up and and if it's adopted more by governments by businesses uh as as a medium of exchange the value just goes up meaning if you own it your what you have goes up but most of us can't buy in at that level don't have enough to invest to have that investment be meaningful as they just noted in that clip if you have you know $150 or even $500 in Bitcoin and it goes up, you're not going to feel it. If you have a uh, billion dollars, didn't I just see uh, Elon Musk put a, one and a half billion in Bitcoin? After deriding it for all this time. And the Bitcoin champions are saying, see, I told you. And I'm saying, yeah, see, I told you. Of course he's going to jump in. And with all that money, he can invest and even risk losing that money if necessary, and then be in position to benefit the most when the stock goes up. By the end of 2020, it is equal to five and a half million Bitcoins, roughly one third of the Bitcoin circulation. It's, 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 I'm sorry, it says, we show that the balances held at intermediaries have been steadily increasing by 2014. By the end of 2020, the the balances held by intermediaries is five and a half million Bitcoins, roughly one third of the Bitcoin in circulation. In contrast, individual investors collectively control eight and a half million Bitcoins by the end of 2020. The individual holdings are still highly concentrated. The top 1,000 investors control about three million Bitcoin and the top 10,000 investors own around five million Bitcoins. So again, if only 21 can be mined, and as I read, at least 3 million, but this, this says 2 million. If 2 million of those are already out of circulation and only 19 million are left, five and a half is held by intermediaries, which I'm, I'm, I, I think I understand to mean exchanges and uh, you know, third-party wallets. 
eight and a half million by individual investors with the top 1,000 already controlling 3 million Bitcoin uh, and the top 10,000, 5 million. I'm not seeing a lot of room left, even if black people or any other group of colonized impoverished people decided to collectively invest they don't have enough money and there aren't enough coins left so you can get your little satoshis which are pieces of coins or I, but this idea of it leveling the playing field or you know now, Reggie and others I've seen try to argue that that unlike what we just saw with the CoffeeZilla cats, that 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 somehow wealth is not a zero sum game. I mean, Reggie Middleton actually argued that in our in our debate, which would mean by his calculation that every single person can become equally wealthy, which of course completely misunderstands the history and purposes and origin of money, which is to manipulate people to do what you couldn't otherwise get them to do if you didn't, if they didn't have, or you didn't have what they wanted to trade. That's why currencies are extensions of imperial powers. They are imposed on people to force them to their will, not to create a, a pathway to them to become rich. The dollar, the pound, whatever are imposed on people as a mechanism of control. So if everybody could somehow become equally wealthy, so, and, and my point, I'm sorry, I skipped a step. Currencies are imposed by imperial policies. Were Bitcoin to become adopted at the level replacing these existing currencies, fiat or otherwise, that would be as an extension of imperial policy. And therefore, by definition, cannot lead to a redistribution or a coming up of the of the poor into wealth. Anyway, they they the the, the paper um, explains how they they in, the the short version. The best I could ability to explain what they did was they created algorithms to to address the issues I raised earlier about. The anonymity of of accounts um, or addresses, I should say, they're not really accounts. the The anonymity of addresses on on Bitcoin that house the the the, the that are keys to where the the coins are housed on the blockchain. To address the anonymity and the pseudonymity, the the uh, an algorithm or algorithms were created to to track flows of bitcoin to uh to show when they are being pooled or are owned by a single user i mean something was done here to try to address i can't properly explain it that's why i would encourage others to check this out um i don't know that i fully under i definitely don't understand the algorithmic part or you know how they did and they explain that in here so I'm just going to continue to stick with with their conclusions. And since they addressed, at least since they claim to address some of these methodological gaps, I'm going to I'm going to give at least another level of, of, of credibility to the to their conclusions. If others get into it and show that they did it wrong, I'm happy to see that discussed. Uh, to address this challenge, we scrutinize the addresses in the rich list that have uh, a balance of at least 1,000 Bitcoins as of December 31st, 2020. Now, uh, the rich list is, is a list that that is often referred to, again, of, of addresses that have more than 1,000 Bitcoins in them. There were 2,258 such addresses, which controlled 7.9 million Bitcoins, almost half of all Bitcoins in circulation. So 2,200 addresses have half of the Bitcoin. At at most, that would be 2,258 individuals. It is likely that those addresses are represent um, certain pools or or multiple people. So it's likely that it's far fewer than that. But at most, that would be uh, 2,258 individuals already have half of the bitcoins in circulation. 
The fact that so few addresses control almost half of the Bitcoins in circulation is often taken as prima facie evidence of the high concentration of Bitcoin holdings. This view, however, neglects the fact that some of these addresses belong to cold wallets and therefore represent holdings of a large number of people. So sort of as I was saying. Now, this was a little bit worded confusingly to me because as I've understood it, cold wallets are those that are disconnected from the Internet, giving another level of of protection from theft hot wallets are connected to the internet and and are encrypted but that much more susceptible to an attack but whatever whatever i whatever i have right or wrong about that uh in terms of what's being said here the point is that some of those addresses as i was just saying could represent a large number of people um or represent the holdings of a large number of people So actually that contradicts, that's what I thought when I, that's what I thought that contradicts the, the the point I was just making. So maybe there are more than 2,258 people if one address represents a large number of people. Yeah, I might've had that backwards. Okay. So we know that there are 2,258 addresses. We don't know exactly how many people that is. It could be neglects the fact that some of these addresses belong to cold wallets and therefore represent holdings of a large number of people. So we don't know if it's 2,250 people or 200, 2,258 people or more, but the point still remains that the, those addresses have half of the Bitcoin in circulation. In the final step, we look at the concentration of individual Bitcoin ownership. We see that only 1,000 clusters control 3 million Bitcoins and up to, in the top 10,000 own more than 5 million, which is about a quarter of outstanding Bitcoin. In contrast, let's see. So we show that while the balance is held at intermediaries have been steadily increasing since 2014, even by the end of 2020, it comprises only 5.5 million Bitcoins, about one third of the Bitcoin in circulation. In contrast, individual investors collectively control eight and a half million Bitcoins, almost half of the Bitcoin in circulation by the end of 2020. The Bitcoin ecosystem is still dominated by a large and concentrated, large and concentrated players, be it large miners, Bitcoin holders, or exchanges. This inherent concentration makes Bitcoin susceptible to systemic risk and also implies that the majority of the gains from further adoption are likely to fall disproportionately to a small set of participants. Hence why, Max, Kaiser, and others are so coked up and giddy. <laughs> uh, okay. Um. <clears throat> so that was it. That's it. That was all. That was that was it. Uh. So I'm gonna. I, I'll I'll wrap on that segment on that part of the uh the today's discussion for now. Um, I just wanted to, to, you know, get into that a little bit, a little bit, and I find it fascinating. Um, now as a segue, as I've already said before, what I think is a major problem here is that black capitalism is in effect, what is being rebranded by all of this discussion, uh, in black communities of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency solving all of our problems. Um, And it's why I think we get and have gotten historically such a bastardized view of Dr. King in an attempt to justify and promote and support endeavors towards black capitalism, mainstream political uh, political uh, uh, engagement uh, uh, and um, uh, a kind of fantasy about what can uh, potentially be done here as a response. So. All right, and take a quick break, and then we're going to come right back and get into uh, the specifics of uh, really what I wanted to do this morning was to get into uh, a celebration of the real Dr. King, the king they love to hate. So back here in just a minute. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, welcome back, everybody. So as I said, I'm going to be working. I'm going to work from uh, a, a portion of this book um that is recently published uh, prophet of discontent martin luther king jr and the critique of racial capitalism by andrew j douglas and jared a loggins um 
I'm only going to be working from one chapter, chapter three, titled Something is Wrong with Capitalism. Uh, but the book is 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 fascinating, and I haven't I, I haven't I didn't get to enough of it before this morning to um, do more with it than than I'm going to. But what I'd like to do is use it to uh, or or use an old presentation of mine to supplement or to add a little bit to the discussion uh, that they engage in in that chapter. Uh, I also want to quickly. Uh, even before doing that, at least share, you know, and I'll put this in the show notes as well, this new article from Covert Action Magazine published this morning, did J. Edgar Hoover order the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr.? I haven't fully, you know, it's it's another one of these long, deep uh, 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 pieces that I think is fascinating. Uh um, and comports with some of what I think I know about this history and have seen in, in this history. Um, and I think speaks to why we get the version of King that we get projected to us and why uh, he was such a threat. Uh, so the official story of King, as they say here, of King's assassination killed by James Earl Ray is full of holes. Instead, mounting evidence suggests that King may have been murdered as part of a conspiracy planned or abetted by the FBI in coordination with local Memphis police personnel. In this scenario, Ray served as a patsy, like like critics allege uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was in the JFK assassination. The real shooter, according to these accounts, struck King not from the boarding house bathroom, allegedly where, shot, where Ray shot him, but from the bushes behind the Lorraine Motel, the King assassination's version of the grassy knoll. This article lays out that evidence, uh, as it may soon be laid out in court and a congressional committee if the King's family's demands re to reopen the murder investigation continue to gain traction. So we all know this famous photo. I'm going to come back to that and, and some of that in a, in a little bit. But um, again, excised from the film Selma and, and other histories uh, is the relationship that Stokely Carmichael and Kwame Ture had to Dr. King. Um, and there's a lot of fascinating, you know, um, you know, you get a look at the, the, the room where King was said to have been killed from James Earl Ray. Uh, Um, the FBI was never able to match the bullet that killed King with the rifle alleged allegedly by Ray on the steps of, of the can, canop is it canopy or canipe canopy amusement company. I don't, I don't know if they're many meaning to spell canop. I know it's not canopy, but is it canipe can I, I don't know. Um, King's widow, Coretta Scott King, said afterwards, there's an abundance of evidence of a major high-level conspiracy in the assassination of my husband. And those of us who have seen the King, uh, the, the, the King Museum in, in Memphis, um, they even have a whole section, which I was surprised to see, uh, on, on the alleged conspiracy. Um, but just a few things here. Ray's fingerprints were never identified in the room or on the rifle. This is what he would have had to look like had he been actually the one one shooting. He would have had to have been in a very awkward position to get the shot off. He was not known to be a good shot when he was in the military, kind of like with, you know, James uh, with um, Lee Harvey Oswald. There's a lot in here about who saw him, who where he was, about why people who are bad witnesses would want to come forward to get 100 grand to put it on Ray. Um there's interesting connections between James Earl Ray and his military service. And uh, uh, he later joined the OSS, the predecessor of the CIA, which I thought was fascinating. I don't remember uh, learning that before. Um, uh, people like Reverend James Orange here said that they saw the shot come from or heard the shot come from the, 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 the bushes, not from the, the motel. Uh, the removal of black firefighters and police officers the day before the hoax that was called in, which would have shown that if, you know, couldn't have been Ray working by himself. If there was a hoax called in while he was supposed to be in position killing, there's these uh, mafia connections, uh, people who claim um, 
uh, Memphis police, uh, Earl Clark, uh, especially were involved. It was, was the killer himself, Meryl McCullough, who we'll come back to in just a minute. Also, uh, military police, CIA was working undercover as a member of the invaders gang, pr- supposedly protecting King that day. Somebody said, uh, Memphis police department, uh, a patrolman, Frank Strasser was the actual killer. So there's a lot anyway. So I just wanted to, to share that very quickly. Um, I, uh, and encourage people to check that out if they're so interested. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is let me pull up. Uh, let's see. What should I do here first? Um, let me pull up. Oh, there was one other thing here related to to King. Uh, his family, which is constantly in dispute and fighting with each other over who has the rights and who has the this and the that. The one thing I, I unfortunately, uh, you know, think that they all come together on is is making really soft and and um, political, you know, soft demands on the state and demands politically that uh, don't do their father justice. So uh, this new story was out the other day that there will be no celebration of, of this holiday until um, the voting rights legislation is restored. Uh, and, and that's, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Martin Luther King III, rather, uh, and 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 um, you know, uh, one or another sibling are just calling for uh, President Biden and Congress use their political muscle to deliver a vital inf- infrastructure deal, and now we are calling on them to do the same to restore the varying voting rights protections my father and countless other civil rights leaders bled to secure. So again, it's just reducing him to uh voting rights protections that is reducing dr king and that's what happens all the time and and his more um you know important uh political um, conclusions that he would evolve are are ignored right um so for my old presentation, I just always like to remind of, of, of at least these couple of points that that uh, the counterintelligence program or COINTELPRO mounted by the FBI to disrupt, mis- misdirect, discredit and otherwise neutralize the civil rights, black liberation, Puerto Rican independence, Native American anti-war socialists and new left movements in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and one of the most notorious U.S. government's domestic anti-radical programs ever developed engaged in what was called black propaganda or the distribution of fabricated articles, leaflets, et cetera, that misrepresented the politics and objectives of an organization or leader in order to discredit the group or individual and to pit uh, organizations against each other. The goal of the COINTELPRO specifically targeting black people was to prevent the rise of a black messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Malcolm X might have been such a messiah. He is the martyr of the movement today. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael and Elijah Muhammad all aspire to this position. King could be a very real contender for this position should he abandon his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrine of nonviolence and embrace black nationalism. But three years before that, he had already been targeted, as described here, by William Sullivan, the head of uh, FBI's COINTELPRO operations for Hoover. Um, King had already been targeted uh, uh, with a plan that aimed at neutralizing Dr. King as an effective Negro leader. In light of King's powerful demagogic speech, that is the March on Washington, we must mark him now if we have not done so before as the most dangerous Negro of the future of this in this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro and national security. All right. So he was already being targeted um, for a radicalism that he is often not credited for today um, and not uh that is often not reminded of even in even by his own family his own his own children um so what the authors here in this book i mean what i love about first of all the first thing i love about what they did here is that they've they've shown me and or reminded me but mostly shown me that there's a lot more work that has arised uh that that has arisen over the years that is attempting to unearth the radical king. So over the last several, I don't know, maybe decade or more, there's been more work produced uh, on, in this area than I was aware of. Hap- I'm, ha- and I'm very happy about that. Um, but I'm also reminded of uh, 
the initial piece that I've read here that that the 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 mission, whether it's organized in that way or not today, is irrelevant. The mission of that black propaganda or black operations of discrediting and misrepresenting the politics of people like Dr. King is still full in effect. So even with all this work and the work even included in this book, we don't get uh, delivered to us, uh, uh, certainly not in Monument down in D.C. That monument down there is a travesty uh, um, in terms of representing the real Dr. King. I think they had one quote on that monument uh, um, that is later than 1966. So none of his radicalism, his his increasing radicalism is reflected there. It's just, it's just anyway. Um, and then what they do is they 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 do like a, a, um, a, a I'm good. I don't know. I, I feel like it's a very strong job of bringing the racial capitalism of Cedric Robinson to bear in an analysis with Marx of what Dr. King's politics really were, saying that uh, essentially that while he appreciated what Marx and Marxism offered, the, the as is often the case, uh, the, the, the lack of specificity or understanding of the colonized or black in this case experience left room for Marx's analysis to be updated uh, or amended. Uh, and certainly the, the 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 association of communism to atheism was also a problem for King, but not its critique of capitalism. In that point, I want to just, you know, in other words, he was he was really good with Marx in terms of a critique of capitalism, but wanted to add, as the authors argue here in 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 a, in, in a different language, the, the the ideas of the anti-colonial world, the the world majority uh, colonized world in 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 his analysis. So what they do in here, so when they talk about in this chapter, that is chapter three, something is wrong with capitalism, King's call for a revolution of values. I really appreciated what they've done here because I always assumed that when King said we need a revolution of values, what he really was doing was saying, I don't want to be, be uh, I don't want to be seen as coming too hard by saying we need a revolution. But they do something here I am not going to do justice to. And so I just want to at least acknowledge that they've done it and that I saw that they did it, but I'm not, I don't think capable of fully giving it its its due. What they do is 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 connect King's revolution of values to what Marx was saying about his 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 uh um uh labor theory of value, which I thought is fascinating. So they talk about, so King, they, so they, they acknowledge King said we need a revolution of values. Then he, they say, quote, we must rapidly begin to shift from a thing oriented society to a person oriented society. He said, for when machines and computers profit, when, when machines and computers, when machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism and militarism are in, incapable of being conquered. A little bit earlier on the page, they say, so King, for his part, claimed to have read Capital by himself over Christmas holiday in 1949. If I was ever going to call bullshit on Dr. King. <laughs> and that's just my own, that's just my own projecting my own jealousy or hate. There's no way. At any point in my intellectual development, at, 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 even at its height probably when I was in grad school. There's no way I could have read Capital in any meaningful way over one holiday by myself. I don't think Capital is something that can be read individually uh, uh, by anyone, but I, I'm just projecting my limit limitations of my genius. Um, so when I read that line, I was like, get out of G, what is it, G-T-F-O-H. Um, anyway, they all say here, we have acknowledged his avowal of dialectical methodology, which in its emphasis on processes and interconnections and the movement of parts within social totalities helps to demystify the social relations sustained by the circulation of capital. By invoking Marx's way of thinking about capital as value in motion, 
we attempt to allay the spirit of the Marxist front story analysis that King's economic thinking can be said to parallel or exemplify while also giving ourselves the latitude to include more of a backstory, in particular, the political projects of racial formation. So after the claim that he read Capital himself over Christmas holiday in 1949, all I will say that I understand about that paragraph read very quickly once again for you all is that when Marx talks about capital needing to be in motion for it to have any value, that process, what Marx argues about that process, King takes to motioning, if if you will, to a revolution of values so that he can add the Black experience to Marx's analysis. So in other words, that in the process of capital being capital and motioning through, the, through society, being moved, invested and moved and taken out and all that other stuff, there's something going on in there that, 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 ossifies a racialized experience for those so deemed in that society. So in other words, Marx wasn't dealing with a society that had black people colonized internally. So, so he didn't necessarily see or confront that, although he wrote about colonization elsewhere. I don't know. That's how, that's at least that's, that's, that's where I'm going with it, how I took it. Um, but then, so then, so so what they and and what what the authors here do that I think is really important is they then uh, pivot to a, a discussion of King's summers in Chicago in sixty six and sixty seven, right? Sixty six, I believe, to start where he got that um, movement out of the South into the North and saw that the, the, the struggle he had been engaged in in the Southern civil rights component needed amendment and adjustment when being moved up North uh, uh, and being shocked by the specifics of how it was carried out uh, in the North, which is what I think added to his already existing, inter as I'm going to show you, internal colonial argument, but I think and interpret what they're saying here to be what added on to his, I read Marx, but having gone through what I went through in the South and now seeing what I have to deal with in the North, there's something else missing beside the religious piece. There's something else missing in Marx that we need to, we need to get here. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm probably not doing it justice, but I, 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 I that's how I'm, I've read it. Uh, Paul Heidman and jo Jonah Birch remind us that, quote, when people first begin to move in collective action against the injustices that confront them, they almost always do so with ideological tools fashioned from their society's dominant ideology. It is only through the course of struggle itself that people begin to discard this ideology in favor of one they fashion themselves, a process epitomized by Martin Luther King Jr.'s radicalization over the course of the 1960s. I couldn't agree more with that. And another reason not to keep going back to the previous thing, but this is why black capitalism keeps coming back in, why this nonsense about crypto and all this other stuff keeps coming back in, because when people first begin to move in collective action against injustices, they almost always do so with ideological tools fashioned from their society's dominant ideology. By the way, this is even how I lit here when John Henry Clark used to talk about when I first started to get, get come into political struggle. Of course, I started with the communists because they were the most overtly anti-capital, anti, you know, anti-establishment struggle. Then I need, needed to add on to it. Or go into to, a, you know, or bring in the Africanness of it. I get all of that. And, and that's why I'm saying like people who are just now waking up. That's why, you know, I, I do think it's it's. I don't I don't try to do it too much, but maybe again, as I said the other day, millennials are adopting crypto more than anybody else. This is their entrance into what they think is political struggle. And they're starting from a place that is firmly held within the, the society's dominant ideology. That is capitalism and investment in, in, in business smarts.
In the words of Reverend J. Pius Barber, who taught King at Crozier Theological Seminary in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the young King thought that the capitalist system was predicated on exploitation and prejudice poverty, and that we wouldn't solve these problems until we got a new social order. Sylvie Laurent has argued that while King was influenced by his formal training, books and classes simply provided him with an intellectual framework and curiosity, which only substantiated his earliest sentiments, feeding his encompassing critique of an American system in which the words exploitation and capitalism became inseparable, end quote. So he had this early critique of capitalism. He had his early critique of, of um, the social order. But of course, as, as Birch and Hodelman said, he was caught up in, in the ideology, dominant ideology initially, as we all would be, as we all maybe still are. So he, he, he uh, um, anyway, this is why he increasingly becomes radical in the 60s. And this is why, as just to, just to, just to follow along here, this is why, as I show here, uh, using the, the, the Washington Post, uh, in January 2nd of 1966, he's still in the top rankings for most admired man. He's, he's, Dr. King is number six on a list of people recommended for, uh, uh, the Gallup polls, most admired man of, of, of that, of that coming year. Um, President Johnson had gotten it in 65. King was a, a, a top 10 contender for man of the year in 66. So he had not been seen yet in early 66 as the threat that he would become. He's still on the list with Lyndon Johnson, Eisenhower, RFK, Billy Graham, Pope Paul VI, Nixon, Hubert Humphrey, Barry Goldwater, and Harry Truman. So he's the only black one on the list and he's and, and no one on that list could be seen as, as coming from from struggle. But this was, that is th this time in, in the mid sixties was still marking what, what the authors uh, uh, in Prophet of Discontent here say, as others have historically, as King said himself, was the first phase of King's work, which took dead aim at measurable obstacles to individual opportunity. So it's just like what's said about the history of, of escaping enslavement. Initially, those first few years, black people were like, whoever could get free broke out on their own. That was that. By the end of the, the, the form of enslavement, most commonly uh, uh, you know, known in this society, by the end of that, by the time the movie uh, uh, Django was supposed to have taken place, nobody was, it was not news that black people wanted to be free as a collective, that it was seen that the system itself had to, to be dropped, not just individuals escaping as, you know, catch as catch can and all that kind of stuff. So King's first phase described was the same thing. We just need some rights. We need to get on the bus. We need some desegregation. We need to be sitting at the lunch counter, so on and so on and so on. After Montgomery, the SCLC, girded by the old left veterans such as Bayard Rustin, Stanley Levison, and Ella Baker, had dreamt of spreading a boycott wildfire across the South, but was compelled rather quickly to pivot to voter registration, in part because the anti-discrimination politics of, of a rights bill, of a rights-based liberalism, obscured the connections between racial domination and capitalist predation. I love this. I love this point that they make here. Just one, let me just let me just one second here. I love this point that they make here. I always want my window open, but then the sun just comes in all funny sometimes. So anyway, the blinds open. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Anyway, but I love this point that they're making here because they're again they're 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 reminding us of the increasingly increasing radicalism of Dr. King and why certain things were selected. So remember, look at what they're saying here, because to this day we're being told, and I've talked about it, you know, some at least, to this day we're being told we need to boycott like they did with Montgomery. We need to do this like they did in, in, in Montgomery, do that. But, but li listen to the point. Even as the radicals of the day described here as Rustin Levinson and, and Ella Baker were saying we need to spread the boycott movement farther Now, I would argue, especially today, that, that that is not a sufficient move, Only if only because the level of organization that would be necessary 
and the the targeting of multinational corporations is very difficult. Excuse me, with a boycott. It's not like boycotting one municipality, one one bus system in one municipality. Boycotting a multinational conglomerate takes a whole other level of organization. But 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 the reason that even that was seen as in as as too much. And why there was a specific going back again, going back to where I even started with Dr. with, with Martin Luther King the uh, third, saying we're not supporting our father's holiday until Biden restores the voting rights. The only reason that they're focused on voting was because the anti-discrimination politics of a rights-based liberalism obscured the connections between racial domination and capitalist predation. It was not until the campaigns moved north to the slums of Chicago that the constituent interconnections of racial capitalism came to bold into bolder relief in a way that King could more openly acknowledge. Get your voting rights. Go do some voting rights. It and some some some, you know, because that will obscure. How did they put this there again? It will obscure the connections between racial domination and capitalist predation. But when you target more directly, even in a boycott or more directly, uh, um, as I would argue, public policy or even the the vote itself. Uh, But perhaps not in the ways described here, uh, the, you end up, you do end up more confronting the racial domination and its relationship to capitalist predation. And that's something that, that's a connection we're not encouraged to make. Again, why I would argue that there's so much prevalence for black capitalism and, and investment to this day, because it, you know similarly investing in a Wall Street speculative product does not threaten or does not demonstrate the connections between racial domination and capitalist predation. In fact, quite the opposite. It says, no, there is no racial predation or racial dominance of capitalist predation, because if you just get more financially literate and spend your money and invest wisely and get into some Bitcoin, you'd be free. So as I show here, uh, um, from again, just a few days after the January second, nineteen sixty six article saying that King was was a man of the year contendant, in January eighth of nineteen sixty six, King launches in Chicago the most significant northern freedom movement ever attempted by major civil rights groups. Our objective uh, will be to bring about the unconditional surrender of forces dedicated to the creation and maintenance of slums, and to ultimately make slums a financial and moral liability upon the whole community. This is one of my favorite plans that Dr. King had had wanted to in, in, engage. And I said, say to this day, can you imagine, especially right now, in the middle of a pandemic where people are being encouraged uh, and almost forced out of their homes and their jobs and their health care, imagine the dominant civil rights leader or the dominant activists of today working in some level of 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 uh collusion although that puts a negative connotation but if they if they conspired another negative connotation but another word i like if they worked together to do this to say okay we're gonna even if we're just gonna pick one we're going to one hood one community where people in our community are suffering the most and we're gonna say nobody is not only is nobody getting evicted But the money that should be deposited or given over to a slumlord will be used, collected, as King and them were saying then, to improve the conditions of the homes and the housing. Imagine if that had happened, if that was going on right now. In the Riverside speech, King, uh, uh, the famous Riverside speech, we'll come back to shortly from 1967. By the way, uh, uh, check our channel for the the Dr. King video we we, we put up at, at BPM, uh, where you hear him in his own words. 
espousing the politics described here uh, that 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 seemingly his own children want to not focus on. But in that Riverside speech, church church speech that was given a year to the day before his assassination, King harkened back to the founding of the SCLC, an organization that uh, set out to save the soul of America. And he stressed again his longstanding fear of a humanity devoid of spiritual grounding. The personalist theologian Nikolai Berdyaev, uh, with whom King was familiar, wrote in a 1935 essay on Marxism that without the spiritual element, there cannot be talk about the attainment of the totality of life. That is true, that even within Marxist communities, there are arguments about, you know, pro-theology, pro-spirituality arguments. So this idea that anyway, you know, I mean, anyway, but, you know, it's just cracker ideology, so why bother? The spiritual element, again, found concrete expression in King's personalism, and it adds another layer of complexity to King's developing critique of racial capitalism. Throughout his life, King had to reckon with anti communist hysteria, including American attitudes towards Marxism and the spirituality question was central to its to his maneuvering. The pressure he felt to situate his vision vis-a-vis -vis Marxist thought was yet another way in which King was constrained by dominant mid-century ideology. But King's public disavowal of Marxism underscores not only the difficulties he faced in wrestling his resting his thinking from the political economic conservatism of rights-based liberalism, it also vivifies the ways in which his mature critique of racial capitalism exceeds the terms of European radicalism and exhibits distinctive features of the black radical tradition. I love what they're saying here. If you read, as they reference here, his speeches to the, to the SELC leadership retreats in 66 and 67, he says very clearly, I'm not against communism or Marxism for their political conclusions. I know that a lot of our people are going to struggle with, the, with, with them, with the, with the labeling and with their anti-religiousness, but that's separate from saying that their critique of capitalism is wrong. So as this, as the authors are here saying, he is just exceed he exceeds the boundaries of European radicalism, and exhibits distinct features of the Black radical tradition, which does not, I think, mean discarding Marx and Marxism. It just means it just needs to be built on, it needs to be expanded. But I don't hear that in a lot of the critiques of Marx from within our communities. I don't hear that part. I just hear the he's just white. And that's that, and we don't need him. But I don't hear, I've read him, I studied him, I see his value, but there's insufficiencies. That would be the case with everybody. By the way, as I'm showing here, this is this is an article from, again, February 25th, 1966, the Washington Post, where uh, Dr. King sits down with Elijah Muhammad, who was also a named threat in the COINTELPRO papers, um, and then says here that the rent presently being paid to the landlord will be paid to us, and we will use... Uh, that's to say, use the rent money to renovate the building. That's gangster. That to me is gangster. Um, Berdeyev, for his part, would go on to claim that the materialist tradition of Marxist communist thought wants to return to the wants to return to the proletariat, the means of production alienated for him, but it does not at all want to return the spiritual element of human nature alienated from him spiritual life. That's a good, I like that argument. So Marxism, you want to return what we've been removed from pro materially and alienated from materially, but you don't want to return us to the spiritual element of human nature that, that, so again, even the European Marxists are acknowledging the insufficiency of the, the, uh, the, the relationship of Marxism to religion. The ins insufficiency. Berdier have argued that man belongs not only to the kingdom of Caesar, but also the kingdom of God, and that man possesses a higher dignity and totality of value of life if he is a person. While King believed that Marx had analyzed the economic side of capitalism right, 
Like Berdeyev, he worried that, as he said to the SELC staff in 1966, Mark, quote, Mark didn't, Marx didn't see the spiritual undergirdings of reality, end quote. There is a temptation to read King's emphasis on the spiritual, along with his concern that materialism had mushroomed into one of modern society's great evils, as an expression of an overriding idealism of sort, a sign that his conceptual and methodological, methodological moorings discourage any sustained critique of political economy. It is not clear that King ever really understood materialism in its strict Marxist sense of the term. As his former Morehouse College professor Melvin Watson pointed out to him in, 19, in a 1953 letter in an effort to correct his reading of Marx, Marx, quote, Marx's position was that the culture was that the culture thoughts, in fact, the whole life of man is conditioned by the means of production, end quote. This variety of materialism is very difficult to refute, Watson said. But King's point, like Berdeyev's, was just that a strict methodological materialism does not capture the spiritual dimensions of anti-capitalist protest, nor does it honor the ways in which a more satisfactory and or sustainable mode of living would make room for the cultivation of spiritual or other meaning-making human activities. This, to me, is the best refute. This, I got to shout out to these guys right here, man. Even as an atheist, materialist, Marxist, communist, socialist, I'll claim all of them. I don't care. This is the best explanation to me of, from a Marxist perspective, of why Marxism is insufficient or maybe misread or maybe doesn't understand, doesn't, isn't, isn't interpreted properly by a non Western lens. And yet you have a black and a European, Mar well, a, a white Marxist and a black radical Christian semi-Marxist, both agreeing what Jop, what, um, I mean, Jop for sure, check into Jop for sure. Uh, I'm sure others, I, I'm anyway, but what, for instance, Jop, and others would have said the same exact thing. The reason Europeans developed the version of God and a hostility towards the, the, the material uh, and even spiritual worlds is because of their material conditions of, of coming up in, in an ice age, having no sun, having no vegetation, no spices, et cetera, and so forth. Of course, that would impact how you saw because if you're in Africa and the sun is providing everything, of course the sun is going to be, you know. But if you're in Europe and the sun is like, dang, you still coming up and this is all I get, maybe you're going to be a little hostile. Maybe you will graft onto an existing African mythological, spiritual, scientific, musical allegory the very real story of the son of God coming down here, being punished, and then having to leave. Maybe that would be part of, 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 a, of a view of the divine that is itself hostile to people who are growing up in an ice age down here. Maybe that makes, it makes sense to me. I mean, I don't know. But I really like what they did here with that. I really, I really like that. Marx's position was that the culture, thoughts, and effects, the whole was conditioned by right by the means of production. But then Berdyaev and King, in his own way, were saying, wait a minute. If we had a socialist reality, if we had a communist reality that might make room for new forms of spirituality to emerge. People might think differently about their 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 divine. If if um, shoot, I might too. Maybe that's the best way to end atheism. <laughs> Get rid of capitalism. What emerged from indigenous black struggle in the modern period was a revolutionary consciousness that proceeded from the whole historical experience of black people, and not merely from the social formations of capitalist slavery or the relations of production of colonialism. The spiritual occupies a central place here, not as an opiate, not as evidence of reactionary ideological consciousness, but as part of the psychology of active and sustained resistance. I, I like that. I'm down with that. I'm down with that. 
King went to Chicago to foment something similar, a spiritual transformation of the ghetto. He went to Memphis to express a spiritual connection with labor. And they're quoting him here. It's saying a spiritual transformation, a spiritual transformation of labor. And he found there an audience moved by how his exemplary determination to fight on his indefatigable courage was itself reflective of a quote, good spirit. So just my note in the margin, and I want to reiterate what I wrote my note self here, is that Dr. King's critique of Marx was not to justify capitalism, Black or otherwise. So that's why I last year or earlier, yeah, last year I did the, the Dr. King did not support by Black movement because people like Maggie Anderson and all these others running around here saying that the Black business community is what sustained the the movement and King knew it himself and all that nonsense. King said very clearly, and where do we go from here, chaos or community, that, that by black would not work. So he's intentionally misquoted here. And I think this is part of what, what is done. People will say, oh, see, he was critical of Marx. Because his argument is that Marx in this way is insufficiently revolutionary, not because he's supporting a capitalism. King's worry at Riverside about the an approaching spiritual death was none other than the concern about the prospective annihilation of a people and its resistance struggle. And it is important to emphasize that the, con the concern is, is central to the critique of racial capitalism, which trains focus not only on the exploitation of labor and resources, but also on the ways in which the logics of capital accumulation render Black people vulnerable to premature death, both corporally and spiritually. And shout out to Frank Wilderson, libidinally, libidinally. <laughs> uh, Jody, uh, accumulation under capitalism is necessarily exploitation of labor, land, and resources, Jody Melamed says, but it is also a system of expropriating violence on collective life itself. At issue is a technology of anti relationality the production of social separateness, the disjoining and deactivating or relations between human beings and humans in, in nature need for capitalist exploitation to work. Melamed goes on to cite Ruth Wilson Gilmore's seminal definition of racism as, quote, the state sanctioned and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerabilities to premature death. In distinct yet densely interconnected political geographies. King argued in 1966 that races, in other words, internal colonies, as King was a supporter of it as an analysis as well. King argued in 1966 that racism is based on the affirmation that the very being of a people's of a very people as is inferior and that the ultimate logic of which is, ra is of racism is genocide. We've talked about that a, a number of times here, and I'm so glad that it, it, it I'm glad that more that it is circulating more these, these statements from his SELC retreats where he did say the ultimate logic of racism is genocide. And as the authors start off the book, as I covered here a few weeks ago, in his critique of Andy Young, Dr. King said, I don't need to hear from you, Andy. You're a capitalist. I'm not. It's my favorite part of the book, by the way. Uh, this conception of racism, this, this concern with systemic annihilation of a people undergirds King's mature critique of how capitalism works as a system of expro expropriating violence on collective life itself. King moved beyond the terms of European radicalism, but he believed that Marx had analyzed the economic side of capitalism right. And that part is a quote from King that he had, that Marx had analyzed the economic side of, of capitalism right. Capitalism carries the seeds of its own destruction, King wrote in 1951. I am convinced that capitalism has seen its best days in America, and not only in America, but in the entire world. It is a well-known fact that no social institution can survive when it has outlived its usefulness. This capitalism has done. This capitalism has done. It has failed to meet the needs of the masses. That's obvious. That's obvious in 2022. Yeah, we're going to come to this part in just a second. Yeah. Beyond the demystification, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, wait, wait, wait. Uh, this insinuation again. Uh, 
is that King was worried about how the ideological superstructure of capitalist modernity, established laws and political ideas, shared principles, indeed shared values, prevents further development of productive, of productive and social capacity, further development of our very ability to relate to one another in ways that serve human needs, both material and spiritual. Is this not seen in any better display than the current argument around Bitcoin and cryptocurrency saving us? That the ideological superstructure of capitalist moder modernity through all of its laws and political ideas and shared principles, indeed shared values, has has been delivered into this as as a as a mythology of a, of investment opportunity to freedom. I don't mean to keep bringing that back up, but I'm obviously stuck in that rabbit hole right now. Beyond the demystification of epistemic commitments, King sought to expose a mode of domination built into the material reproduction of capitalism's social form, which, as I understand, is the 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 added value to Marxist thought of. I mean, even, you know, of certainly of Walter Rodney, but even of a Cedric Robinson's critique that I'm not entirely sure I agree with in its dis dis description of Marx, which is why I think even our interview with Frank Chapman is important and should be revisited uh, because of his critique of Cedric Robinson's analysis of Marxism. But nevertheless, in either case, In, in, in interpreting what Marx and Engels even said about capitalism as a social order, to understand that social form or order, you have to understand the colonial or colonized lens or the, the, the view uh, from the bottom of the well, as Derek Bell put it, or the view of black people. Um, King said the continuation of persistent poverty is incendiary because the poor cannot rationalize their deprivation. But more to our point, King argued that depressed living conditions for Negroes are a structural part of the economy, that certain industries are based upon the supply of low-wage, underskilled, and immobile non-white labor. How is this confronted by Bitcoin? <laughs> this is why he attacked the slums so what much as he did. Because he said he saw them as, quote, a system of internal colonialism a situation that is true only for Negroes. He said again, he understood the point that black people had been partitioned, isolated, immobilized, stigmatized, in essence, devalued, and that this was a structural part of the economy. Again, that structural part of the economy is not addressed by even a brand new technology or currency. If we think of capital as value in motion, then we can think of devaluation as what happens whenever and wherever its motion is disrupted. Whenever and wherever the process of, re of reproduction is checked, Marx said, both use value and exchange value go to the devil. Devaluation must also be seen as the underside of overaccumulation. Skipping slightly ahead, at the rate of profit, as the rate of profit tends to slow system-wide, we are confronted with, as Marx put it, overproduction, speculation crises, and surplus capital alongside surplus population. My God, I didn't even catch this the first two times I read this. Is this not exactly what's going on right now with the Bitcoin and the crypto? As the rate of profit tends to slow system-wide, it slowed. As we showed the other day, all this investment in crypto uh, kicked off primarily in the last year or two. During the rate of profit slowing. And as Marx put it, we get we get overproduction, meaning more than we can buy. We get speculation crises. Crypto. And surplus capital needing a place to invest and then be turned into money, like investing in crypto and convincing other people to invest in it right behind it to boost its value so that it can be removed, get its profit extracted and invested in something else, goes along a surplus population. And who are the people being encouraged, particularly in the Black community, to invest in Bitcoin? The surplus population, the people who don't have adequate money, income, wealth. Housing, healthcare, jobs, da 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 da. That's who. That's who. 
The simple revelation is, revelation is profoundly significant in how we might understand King's call for a revolution of values. So again, I'm reading all these years, King saying revolution of values and think, man, he's just trying to be, you know, trying to soften up the argument, da, da, da. But I like what they're doing here. He was up, he was up to something that I wasn't aware of. This is very dope. What I want to do right now, because uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to take, a, I want to, I'm going to, we're going to do our version of a commercial break because I want to work in to further prove the, the lack of justice I'm doing. I want to encourage and play a clip from uh, the recent uh, interview on uh, millennials are killing capitalism uh, where they hosted the authors of this book. And they raise a lot, actually. I mean, obviously, we're only going to play a little bit of it. And, I, and people have to really go back and listen, read the whole book and then go back and listen to this whole interview or whichever order is fine with me. Um, but I want to get it to right where they're raising a particular point. It's not going to be exact. So I want to play just a little bit of this. All right, let's start it right there. Ah, that's not why did it move when I let go of the mouse? All right, we'll just start it there. It's close enough. Um, check this out for a few minutes and I'll be right back. I mean, in so many ways, Kane takes cues from older and, and indeed more regressive views of, of Black politics, especially the regarding the role of women. Here, folks might be interested in Brandon Terry and Shatima Threadcraft's essay, Gender Trouble, Manhood, Inclusion, and Justice, which is uh, one of the essays in Brandon and, and Tommy Shelby's really excellent volume on Martin Luther King uh, to shape a new world. Anyway, in the in the essay, rather than offer what they call a qualified acceptance of King, which calls for rescuing him in one way or another from his commitment to patriarchal masculinity, or kind of taking up what they also call the respectful rejection, which calls for, you know, simply turning to other figures in the movement. This is kind of the approach that folks like Peter Ling, Barbara Ransby, Joy James, for example, sort of take up this approach. Over and against these two approaches, they call for thinking with King against King. And they take up this approach uh, for the simple reason that King sort of increasing radicalism, particularly on questions of, of economic justice, necessarily entail a more egalitarian gender politics and in turn a more democratic and non-hierarchical form of organization as well. So here we might think about uh, King's relationship to the welfare rights movement as an example of how he's becoming increasingly egalitarian on the question of gender and how that's sort of developing alongside his, his more radical account of economic justice. This does not mean that we ignore King's commitment to patriarchal masculinity or that we dismiss the male-dominated nature of SELC leadership or the leadership of the National Baptist Convention and so forth. And, you know, in, in some ways it would be a, a scandal to try and diminish <laughs> this feature of, of his thought and of the movement generally. At the same time, you know, King is a profoundly democratic thinker. The beloved community is a profoundly democratic idea that sort of abuses notions of hierarchy, control, and governance. King is never able to fully flesh this out more fully, but I think it's worth pausing for a moment to reflect on the fact that his espousal of socialist ideas and not capitalist ideas is at odds with the prevailing wisdom of Black bourgeois politics at that time. Or to put it another way, his espousal of socialist ideas sort of reflects a commitment to Black mass movement to building new forms of life in concert with those who experience the underside of racial capitalism. This all made King incredibly unpopular in the American public. It put him at odds with some of his own counterparts who were pushing him, for example, to be more forcefully anti-communist. And let's not forget that at the time he was assassinated in Memphis, he was, he was organizing with black sanitation workers who were potentially about to go on strike. So, I think uh, um, I've listened to this several times, this particularly that section, and I'm not, I still am not sure I fully understand everything. So I, I, I definitely encourage the link is already in the show notes that people check this whole thing out. But and there's another clip I want to come back to with it in a little bit. But there's there's one thing in here that I thought that I, I mean, but what I thought was fascinating was the 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 argument that Rams, Ransby and Joy James, if I heard this correctly, and I would I wouldn't want to ask Professor James if, if this her thoughts on this, but 
if there was this sort of respectful rejection of King to say, look, we see his problems with patriarchy. We're just not going to deal with them because we don't want to, we're just going to move on to other people. When I heard that, I heard, if I heard that correctly, and if that's correct, what I hear is also a, is also a concerning in that as, as was being said there, I believe that was Loggins talking. I might be wrong, but that what happens when that happens is that we're not, kept up with King's increasing radicalism, his increasing expansiveness, and what what could be, as I think they were saying, be seen as an increasing uh, uh, disavowal of or, or willingness to confront uh, patriarchy and anything that would be um, a dis you know sort of a, a diminishing uh, well patriarchy and 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 the women that suffer it uh, in particular, but also uh, those who would not be seen as um, uh, sort of truly valuable parts of the community and the struggle that is the working community. So that's why they, they were reminding us of his uh, increasing dem democratic lens or expansive lens, not democracy. I think would be said not big D democratic party, but democracy opening the little D opening of, 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 of his, of his political lens per se to include a, a, a more particular focus on working people, patriarchy, et cetera. And that's why he was killed and engaged in, in uh, the Memphis uh, sanitation strike. Anyway, I, there's a lot more, obviously in that, in that great discussion that they have, I would encourage you all to check it out uh, as well. Um, but back to their to their book here in chapter three, Michael Denning, he said here, has pointed out that under capitalism, the only thing worse than being exploited is not being exploited. This I thought was interesting. Today, we might refer to wages life, wageless life, to a new manifestation of surplus population that in the words of the of the end, end notes collective, need not find it, itself completely outside capitalist social relations. Capital may not need these workers, but they still need to work. They are forced to offer themselves up for the most object forms, abject forms of wage slavery in the form of petty production and services, the gig economy, identified with informal and often illegal markets and direct exchange arising alongside failures of capitalist production. Uh, and though King knew that, quote, no matter how dynamically the capitalist economy develops and expands, it does not eliminate poverty. He argued that in 1967, quote, we have come to a point where we must make the non-producer a consumer or we will find ourselves drowning in a sea of consumer goods. We must, we must make the non-producer a consumer or we will find ourselves drowning in a sea of consumer goods. So to the point of the people who are being not being exploited, but still who have to work, who are quote unquote not productive must still buy things. We all have to be reduced to consumers. He argued that we must create full employment or we must create incomes. People must be made consumers by one method or another. It is tempting to read this emphasis on the expansion of consumption power as a sort of temporal fix to systemic accumulation crises and as a, an approach that might buy a little time for the continued circulation of capital and does nothing to challenge underlying structural contradictions or indeed the reproduction of racial capitalism, social relations. King was ambivalent on this matter, to be sure. But we wager that in his effort to foment a revolution of values, in his effort to rethink this value system, King sought to imagine an economy for which consumption would be driven not by the reproduction of capitalism, not by the reproduction of the unequal and obscured social relations that make accumulation possible, but by the service of human needs. His emphasis on propping up consumption power must be understood in the context of this broader critique. This is fascinating. So I wrote myself in the notion margin here, is this a new mythology of black buying power? Like, is this, is this the radical? So, so like when people misread King or, or try to rebrand re King as supporting black capitalism and buying power and buying black, that they're missing this point here. I thought they were just not reading King. I thought that they were just not reading what he actually said and did and what his actual anti-capitalist arguments were. But I think this is a very, this is a fascinating argument. So, because if in fact these black capitalists 
did read King and would read that he said, we have come to the point where we must make the, the non-producer a consumer or we will find ourselves drowning in a sea of consumer goods. We must create full employment or we must create incomes. People must be made consumers by one method or another. Maybe they thought, I don't know. Maybe that's what Bitcoin Zay uh, is misunderstanding in his book, Bitcoin in Black America, where he argues that all of us have to adopt Bitcoin and force the business community to adopt it, get our money up, and then buy some politicians and enforce them, enforce them to adopt it, and we'll be good. But what they're missing is that King's argument and his revolution of values and, and rethinking this value system is saying we may need to consume, but that consumption should be about the service of human needs, not reproduction of, of uh, capitalist accumulation and the social relations that result in their unequal form. Not by the reproduction of the unequal and obscured social relations that make accumulation possible, but rebranding consumption by the to be about the service of human needs. Certainly makes sense. Okay, um, continuing on here. Because because then the chapter does shift to uh, King's critique of Vietnam. Uh, which, of course, many point to as a turning point. And, of course, uh, with reference to the Riverside speech of 1967, um, where King was already, let's see, uh, land concerns were also a consistent pillar of King's global vision, as evidenced by, for example, his earliest interest in the Indian Bhutan movement and, of course, his mature defense of the northern Vietnamese struggles for land reform. By 1967, and to the consternation of so many in and outside of the movement, King offered an apology of sorts for a northern Vietnamese revolutionary government seeking self-determination, a government that had been established not by China, for whom the Vietnamese have no great love, but by clearly indigenous forces that included some communists, end quote. So as we see here, um, in March, 31st, March 31st, 1966, King to sidestep Viet talk in Sweden pressure from all sides on the internationalizing of civil rights. King decided at this point to not make a statement about his anti-Vietnam stance that was increasingly, develop, increasing, de, increasingly developing in 1966 when he went to Sweden. And he was getting pressure to not do that. And in April of 1966, he's quote, warned, quote, to stick to his own knitting. Talking about Vietnam could seriously jeopardize jeopardize new legislation. So civil rights leaders and others were telling him, as was the right wing, to leave Vietnam alone. In May of 1966, 100,000, more than 100,000 people signed a petition to have MLK brought up on charges with the House Committee on Un-American Activities, or HUAC, to investigate communist infiltration of the so-called civil rights movement, where again, King is linked with, with the radicals of SNCC and the black Muslims. Oh, you know what? You know what? I'm supposed to be doing an interview right now. Dag, I forgot. I'm supposed to be doing a radio interview right now. Hold on. Yes, hello. Uh, hi, this is David Swanson calling for Jared. Yes, sorry, I'm right here. Are you able to hear me? Yes, perfectly. Oh, I am, but uh, sorry, everybody here. I'm I'm in the middle of two different things, and I'm late to your interview. Where you emailed me the link, right? Yeah, I am. Give me two seconds, and I'll join you and and uh, jump on. I apologize. Okay, thanks. All right, here we go. All right, everybody. So let me do this. Uh, I completely forgot I, I, I made that agreement. So what I'm going to do is, let's see, I'm just going to leave everything going. Hopefully you all can stay. I appreciate you all staying. We're just going to, um, because the, the interview was supposed to be about Dr. King. I completely forgot that I was supposed to be, I am using headphones. Request. 
you are joining as a guest. Yeah, that's me. Oh man, my apologies, everybody. I, and to everybody, dang, because I got there's still so much more to go. Um, hmm. Well, I'm just going to hold tight. Can you replay the Hosea describes Dr. King died his own words? Can you replay when Hosea describes the day King? Did I play that? I don't think I have that. And why isn't this link work? Is this? Let's check your camera. I am. This joint is not working. All right, this, this is what I'll do. This is what I'll do. Let's do this. What I'm going to do, private chat. Here's an idea. Yeah, Josh, you suggest that. Let me play a little bit more of that, that millennials uh, interview. Um, or better yet, actually, no, let me not do that. Let me not do that. Let me play a little bit of this King video that we have up on our website. Um, while I do this interview, it shouldn't take more than 10 minutes or so, and then I'll come back and we'll get back into everything here. So if you can stick around, please do, or just come back in a few minutes. Uh, although I am having trouble with this link, so I'm not sure if this interview is going to happen or not. Um, Let's see, I've clicked the link, but it's just sitting there asking about cam permission. Uh, I didn't mean to do that either. Request, request, request. It's just not working. Anyway, let me do let me get this thing set up and, and play this and then I'm gonna come back and we'll do we'll, we'll we'll keep it going. Oh, thanks, Josh. There it is. There you go. All right, let me, um, is this on mine? No, 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 let me do mine. Let me share from, all right, you go ahead and share it. You go ahead and share it, Josh. Um, I'll remove this. Oh, you, you've you added that. Okay. Do me a favor, put it in theater mode and 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 push play on that. And, uh, Everybody sit up in what happened? We had the only American flag there. And they tore it down. They tore it down. They beat us up. Two paint on it. What did you ask about the boys wearing a flower on one side of his shirt and a swastika on the other side? Why did you ask them that? Oh, a song will lift as the mainsail ships and the boat drifts onto the shoreline. And the sun will reflect every face on the deck. The hour that the ship comes in, and the sands will roll out a carpet of gold for your weary toes to be touching. And the ship's wise men will remind you again that the whole wide world is wide. Oh, the foes will rise with the faith that is their eyes, and they'll turn from their bends and think they're grieving. But they'll pin some flaws and squeal, and they'll know that it's for real. The hour that the ship to join with you today in the largest peace demonstration 
ever held in the history of the United States. I understand an hour ago the estimate was more than 125,000 and thousands of people are still in the park trying to get here. And I think this is a magnificent expression of the outpouring of concern and dissent concerning the unjust, immoral war taking place in Vietnam. I come to participate in this significant demonstration today because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I join you in this mobilization because I cannot be a silent onlooker while evil rages. I'm here today because I agree with the poor Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. In these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are chaotic in extent and gigantic in detail, that is no greater need than for sober thinking, mature judgment, and creative dissent. In all our history, there has never been such a monumental dissent during a war by the American people. Polls reveal that more than 10 million Americans explicitly oppose the war. Additional millions cannot bring themselves to support it. And who do assent to it are held hard confused and doubt-ridden. Thousands of thousands of our deepest thinkers in the academic and intellectual community are adamantly opposed to the war. Distinguished church and theological leaders of every race and religion are morally outraged by it. And many young people in all walks of life believe it a corruption of every American value they have been taught to respect. Let no one claim there is a consensus for this war. No flag waving, no smug satisfaction with territorial conquest, no denunciation of the enemy can obscure the billions of pick Americans, repudiate this war, and oppose the war in Vietnam because I love America. I speak out against it in anger, but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart of all with a passionate desire to see our beloved country stand as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I am disappointed with America as they that watch indeed. their little huts burst into flames. And we see little children mutilated and incinerated with napalm. Even closer to us, our own neighborhoods and in our own families we learn of American youth destroyed and maimed in savage combat. American mothers and fathers are given coffins and medals, crippled sons and pious praise and yet many of them are bold enough to declare their sacrifice 
has no meaning. They have suffered the ultimate loss and from it feel a sense of no gain. There is a quiet terror in every draft eligible boy as families contemplate possible death that waits in jungle depths for our sons and husbands. The American people have freely given their lives in many struggles where genuine American interests were threatened. In its deepest sense, the immorality of this war lies in the tragic fact that no vital American interest is in peril or jeopardy. We are waging war in a contest that is fully capable of resolution by peaceful means. I express here not merely my own opinion, but many of the thoughts of some of our nation's foremost statesmen, leading newspapers, outstanding historians, and political scientists. This judgment is shared abroad by heads of nations who have been our, our allies in peace and war. This judgment is shared by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Utah. This judgment is shared by Pope Paul and countless eminent world figures. This war cries out to be brought to an end. One of the greatest casualties of this war is a great society. This confused war has played havoc with our domestic destinies. Despite feeble protestations to the contrary, the promises of the great society have been shot down on the battlefield of Vietnam. The pursuit of this widened war has narrowed the promised dimensions of the domestic welfare programs, making the poor, white and Negro, bear the heaviest burdens both at the front and at home. We have escalated the war in Vietnam and de-escalated the skirmish against poverty. It challenges the imagination to contemplate what lives we could transform if we were to cease killing. I do not say a son of Trump. It is estimated that we spend $322,000 for each enemy we kill, while we spend in the so-called war on poverty in America only about $52 for each person classified as poor, and much of that $53 goes for salaries of people who are not poor. And yet we are told it must be continued because in some mysterious manner, if we make a move toward peace without significant concessions from Hanoi, a catastrophic world defeat awaits us. There is not a shred of substance in this argument. The power we possess is titanic. It can neither be lost nor diminished by unilateral initiatives for peace on our part. It is hard to believe in the words of Utan that the United States with power and wealth unprecedented in human history cannot afford to take the initiative. We took the initiative to enlarge the war on land, on the sea, and in the air. We are strong enough to take the initiative to end this war. I am not absorbing Hanoi nor the Viet Cong of their responsibilities, nor do I condone certain rigid attitudes. 
I'm not naive enough, however, to think that they will come to a conference table while clouds of bombs are driving them into bomb shelters. As an American, my duty is to speak to my government. Even if my philosophy is not welcome in another country, I must constantly strive to make it welcome in Washington. Soldiers from some 10,000 to a half million and launch bombing from the North on a scale as vast as that in World War II. All of this reveals that we are in an untenable position, morally and politically. We are left standing before the world, glutted with wealth and power, but morally constricted and impoverished. We are engaged in a war that seeks to clock, turn the clock of history back and perpetuate white colonialism. And the greatest irony and tragedy of it all is that our nation, which initiated so much of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world, is now cast in the mold of being an arch anti-revolutionary. Now, as a civil rights leader, I want to mention another thing that this tragic war is doing, that our nation cannot support both war and adequate anti-poverty programs, we can do both. But I warn that it is inevitable that the men of power... Fine. All right. How are you? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the press, uh, we have just had a meeting with uh, Dr. Ralph Bunch, and I would like to mention the persons who served on the committee, Dr. Benjamin Spock. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock, I'm naming the persons who were on the committee that just met with Dr. Ralph Bunch. Dr. Ben uh, Benjamin Spock, Mrs. Dagmar Wilson, Mr. Dave Dallinger, uh, Mr. Cleveland Robinson, and Reverend James Bevel, all of whom are a part of this mobilization in a very significant way. Uh, the Secretary General, as you all know, I'm sure, Mr. Utant is in Afghanistan today, and uh, he had uh, the Undersecretary, Dr. Bunch, to receive us and to receive the petition uh, which we presented. Now, I'd like to read the petition, and then you may feel free to ask questions. From towns and villages, uh, cities, campuses, and farms, we have come in tens of thousands to march and rally at the United Nations in New York and at the birthplace of the World Organization in San Francisco on this, the 15th day of April, 1967. We, the participants in today's unprecedented national peace demonstration, although of many national origins, faiths, and shades of political opinion, are united in our conviction of the imperative need for an immediate peaceful solution to an illegal and unjustifiable war. We are determined that the killing be stopped and that a nuclear holocaust be avoided. We rally at the United Nations in order to reaffirm our support of the principles of peace, universality, equal rights, and self-determination of peoples embodied in the Charter and acclaimed by mankind, but violated by the United States. Reverend King, did you have any exchange with uh, Mr. Bunch over your differences of opinion as to the course the civil rights movement should take in this country? Well, I think Dr. Bunch cleared that up himself the other day, so I didn't say anything about it. He came out with a press statement that he thoroughly understood my position. And uh, I've made it clear all the time that there has never been an advocacy on my part of a mechanical merger 
of the civil rights and the peace movement. I have felt, however, that the spirit of the civil rights movement uh, should certainly imbue the peace movement and thereby strengthen the uh, peace movement. Dr. Lewis, have you personal exchange at all, sir? No, other than discussing this petition, and Dr. Bunch made it very clear uh, that uh, the United Nations and the Secretary General are very much concerned about the war in Vietnam, and he made it clear that they were very frustrated and disappointed that uh, they were in a situation where they see for the first time a war taking place since the ex existence of the United Nations that they've been unable to do anything about. And he made it clear also that uh, Utant is still standing on the position that he has expressed uh, over and over again, and that is that we should uh, cease the bombings and the new position of a unilateral ceasefire on the part of the United States, which would be an initiative which we could afford to take. Did Dr. Bunch uh, express uh, support for your point of view on Vietnam? We didn't go into that. I'm uh, sure he supports the Secretary General. He certainly implied that, and I think he said it publicly before. So uh, we didn't go into any details on that. But I think uh, I can be safe in saying that Dr. Bunch would support the position of Utah. Well, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bunch, Dr. King, what is your position? Has been because of all of this today? Well, I hope it will arouse an awareness on the part uh, <laughs> of many, many people in our country and in arousing an awareness on the part of many people cause them uh, to take a stand in their own personal ways against what we consider a very unjust and unjustifiable war and a war that is terribly damaging the soul of our nation. Dr. King, what, what, is your position, what is your position as to the priority? Of the two movements? The priority of the peace movement and the civil rights movement, uh, I think uh, from a content point of view, uh, the issues are inextricably tied together. And the final analysis, there can be no peace without justice and there can be no justice without peace. So I think both of them are priorities and we've got to deal with both of them as basic priorities. Did you say that to Dr. Bunch? No, we didn't discuss that at all. So you discussed with Dr. Bunch? Uh, yes, sir. The medicines in North Vietnam. Do you support this? I'm sorry, I didn't. Do you support the delivery of medicines in North Vietnam by Americans? Oh, of course. I think uh, this is a very humanitarian act. Uh, and I think more and more our concerns must be humanitarian. They must be ecumenical rather than sectional. After all, these are human beings who are suffering. Uh, they are our brothers, even though. Uh, we may disagree with them politically, and uh, I think this is a marvelous act of generosity which I thoroughly support. Dr. Yes, sir. King. Someone over here. Do you consider today's uh, rally a success, Dr. King? Oh, I certainly do. I think it's a marvelous success and a marvelous demonstration of uh, a great concern and an outpouring of dissent uh, <laughs> on uh, the basis of the wrong policy, which I think we followed uh, for all of these years. Dr. 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 King, you have been accused today by some sections of suggesting that in this in the manner of your presentation at the rally, you are taking a one-sided view of this whole problem. Would you like to say anything on that? I've never taken a one-sided approach approach to this problem. I've always said that I recognize the ambiguity of the total situation, and I recognize that if there is to be a peaceful resolution, or if there is to be a negotiated settlement, there will have to be some give and take on both sides. But I think since we took the initiative in building up this war on the ground, on the seas, and in the air, we can certainly take the initiative initiative in stopping the war. And I think there are certain things that we can afford to do which threaten our security in no way. And I've said all along that I'm speaking to America. I am an American. And like the prophets of old who spoke to Israel rather than spending all of that time speaking to Babylon, I want to speak to my own country. Dr. King, the what time happens now, sir? Is this to be the last demonstration or are we to see many more like this? Well, I think this is just the beginning of a massive outpouring uh, of concern and a massive 
outpouring of protest activities uh, concerning this unjust war. I can't give you any programmatic action right now or any dates for the next action program. But I would just say today... Uh, the Chicago chapter of the Public Relations Society of America, I'm privileged to present to you one of the best known and most controversial figures on the American scene, Dr. King. estimated that we spend about $500,000 to kill every enemy soldier in Vietnam. And when we think about the fact that we spend only $53 a year per person for everybody that's considered poverty stricken, and half of this is spent for salaries of persons who are not poor, it means that we have to rethink our priorities. And it is my deep conviction that if our nation can spend $35 billion a year to fight what I consider and will continue to say is an unjust, ill-considered war in Vietnam and $20 billion to put a man on the moon, then we can spend billions of dollars to put God's children on their own two feet right here on earth. And I'm convinced that our government is more concerned at this point about winning the war in Vietnam than about winning the war against poverty right here at home. Who's for this purpose is now being used in the killing process. It's made for great problems in the civil rights movement, but it's made for great problems in poisoning the soul of our nation. And so as we go on in the days ahead, it seems to me that it is vitally necessary to see that the problem of the Negro will not be solved until billions of dollars are available to get rid of poverty, to make a guaranteed annual income a reality for every American family. Now let me say finally, and I guess this moves in the realm of the is the mutuality of the destinies of white and black Americans. We are tied together whether we realize it or not. The Negro needs a white man to save him from his fear. And the white man, we are faced with the fierce urgency of now all over America, we are faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. In this conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as a lost opportunity. Procrastination is still the thief of time. And we may plead passionately with time to pause in her passage, but time is adamant to every plea and rushes on over the bleach bones and troubled and crumbled wreckage of numerous nations and civilizations stand the pathetic words, too late. Omar Khayyam was right. The moving finger writes in having writ moves on. That is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. And in Chicago and every city, we will continue to remind America that the hour is late and the clock of destiny is ticking out. We must make the right choice for justice and brotherhood. We must go all out to make America one. And this is what the civil rights struggle, or I should say now the human rights struggle, is all about. And if we will make the right choice right here in America, we will be able to hew out of the mounting of despair, stone of hope. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. And we will speed up the day when every man will respect the dignity and worth of all human personality and all men in our country 
will be able to live together as brothers. Thank you. As you can well see, the visitors are far too numerous. I believe that I would have prob probably temporarily sacrificed my pacifism because Hitler was such an evil force in history. But that is nothing like this in the situation in Vietnam, and I call for your attention as I try to set forth my thesis. I would like to use three biblical texts as a basis for our thinking together, two of which are found in the Old Testament and one found in the New Testament about this tragic war. In international conflicts, the truth is hard to come by because most nations are deceived about themselves. Rationalizations and the incessant search for scapegoats. Something is happening and people are not going to be silent. We had a march just a few weeks ago where several spoke, Stokely Carmichael and I spoke there Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. And when I hear them, though I often understand the source of their concern, I'm nevertheless greatly saddened, for such questions mean that the inquirers have not really known me. My commitment or my calling. They seem to forget that before I was a civil rights leader, I answered a call. And when God speaks, who can but prophesy? I answered a call which left the Spirit of the Lord upon me and anointed me to preach the gospel. During the early days of my ministry, I read the Apostle Paul saying, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes, and I decided then that I was going to tell the truth as God revealed it to me. No matter how many people disagreed with me, I decided that I was going to tell the truth. I think all too many preachers, white and black alike, find themselves caught in the yoke of conformity, seduced by the success symbols of the world. We have too often measured our achievement by the size of our parsonage or the size of the wheelbase on our automobiles. We as preachers have too often become showmen to please the whims and caprices of the people. We preach comforting sermons and avoid saying anything from our pulpits which might disturb the respectable views of the comfortable members of our congregation. And we ministers of Jesus Christ sacrifice truth on the altar of self-interest and like Pilate yielded our convictions to the demands of the crowd. In his essay on self-reliance, we were taking the black young men who had been crippled by society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia which they had not found in southwest Georgia and East Harlem. So we have manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves to an even, even deeper level of awareness. 
for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions without great difficulty. Difficulties in speaking out today grows out of the fact that there are those who are seeking to equate dissent with disloyalty. We are put in the terrible situation of having to go and do battle and fight and kill colored people and poor people who are in the very same situation that we find ourselves in today. Somehow this madness must cease. We must stop now. I speak as a child of God, the brother to the suffering poor of Vietnam. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted. I speak for the poor of America who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at home and death and corruption in Vietnam. I speak for the thousands and thousands of mothers of our land who must see their sons go off to fight an ill-considered unjust war, yes. trembling at any moment not knowing what will happen to them. I speak for all of our boys on the battlefield and the millions of young men, promising young men, who must make decisions today. And those who say that we are enemies of the soldiers in Vietnam, I say, and those of us who are opposing the war are their best friends for what we are saying in substance is that it is time for our boys to come back home and it is time for them to be able to grow up in a world of nobility, in a world of promise. All right, everybody. Uh, again, I apologize for both interrupting the show and then maybe even more importantly, I apologize for interrupting Dr. King uh, and, and thanks to Josh for running that. Um, I, I forgot I had given a, made a commitment to, to, to give a radio interview and uh, um, that done. I'm back and we can wrap up uh, where we were. So I appreciate all of you sticking around who have uh, and, and again, appreciate uh, um, being able to, to interrupt myself uh, and have, you know, be able to come back. So thanks everybody. Um, okay. So obviously just even in what you heard, uh, and the rest of that video is of course on, on our channel at BPM. Uh, so check it out at your convenience and share it. Um, as you heard the, the version of Dr. King that is promoted is not the one that, that was uh, in existence, uh, particularly at the end of his life. So, um, as I said, he had started to increasingly challenge all those around him uh, and becoming more uh, uh, condemning and critical of the, uh, com of the Vietnam uh, War and American imperialism. And as I'm showing here, he was uh, challenged by those around him to not support those efforts uh, and was being discouraged even from sitting down with Elijah Muhammad in Chicago to talk about how they might unite uh, efforts in in bringing uh, 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 the change uh, that we all still need. 
Um, so as as the authors here continuing with Douglas and, and, and Loggins say, uh, the Riverside speech, again, the Riverside Church speech a year to the day before he was assassinated, was a grand culmination of King's vision in so many ways. Though many of the themes we have addressed so far in the chapter receive lit only passing mention. More central to the speech is King's call for a revolution of values within the racial violence of capitalist world of the capitalist world system. Though even this is often obscured by an account of the dominant ideological frame on account of the dominant ideological framework of American neo-imperialism. Too often, appreciation of King's internationalism is hemmed in by a narrow reading of his opposition to the Vietnam War. A 1967 New York Times editorial set the tone for subsequent reception when it framed Dr. King's error in terms of, quote, a facile connection between the speeding up of the war in Vietnam and the slowing down of the war on poverty. So like when King would say that the, the bombs you drop on Vietnam explode at home, uh, trying to point out that if you want to solve poverty and inequality here, redirect the resources being used to, to oppress other black and brown people overseas uh, uh, here. And he's being said that this was a facile connection that he was creating between slowing the war and poverty here. Such a reading supported to be sure by King's own insistence that, quote, our government is more concerned about winning an unjust war in Vietnam than winning the war against poverty at home, end quote, reduces the economic dimension of King's anti-militarism to a matter of opportunity costs, as if the only relevant question has to do with domestic budgetary priority, uh, how best to allocate federal expenditure. This is interesting. This is an interesting in other words, the authors here are saying that King's own grand and analytical frame was absent or ignored in his own probably most prominent radical speech. That's fascinating. But at Riverside, King was clear that the need to maintain social stability for our investments accounts for the counter-revolutionary action of American forces in Guatemala and explains why, quote, American helicopters are being used against guerrillas in Cambodia and why American napalm and Green Beret forces have already been active against rebels in Peru. This is, end quote, the systemic need for the continuous circulation of capital and the ongoing expansion of its spatial boundaries, the dynamic structural imperative of the global market economy accounts for, quote, our alliance with the landed gentry of South America, end quote, and explains why we see, quote, individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries, end quote. King described post-war U.S. imperialism in terms of a stubborn global class politics, an elite refusal to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investments. The implication on a deeper theoretical plane is that warfare had become a crucial resource in the capitalist struggle to resolve escalating accumulation crises. What King sought to confront, in essence, was a proactive government movement seeking to establish and maintain overseas markets for the absorption, absorption of economic surplus. Now, forgive me again, but this is where I don't think the, the cryptogandist cryptologists are properly reading Michael Hudson's work on super imperialism, even as Max Kaiser says, as I showed you, that Hudson is being seen by Bitcoinists as the, the you know, the quote Dr. Umar, the King Kong of consciousness. But what they're missing is what King had right here. That if you read Hudson's work, published shortly after King's assassination, Hudson wrote in Super Imperialism a more uh, in-depth explanation, but was coming behind King on what King had already said. So as the authors say here, what King sought to confront in essence was a proactive government movement seeking to establish and maintain overseas markets for the absorption of economic surplus. What does Hudson say? Post-World War II, the reason why the United States set up its diplomacy to assure or the way the U.S. set up through diplomacy it's the use globally of the U.S. dollar 
and the way it satisfied its own, that is the United States own refusal to properly tax a population uh, 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 and pay for what you need without overextending yourself. But the way to do that is to say, you all overseas have to privatize your economies, reset your public policy, not only to privatize, but then once privatized to have US companies run those institutions and businesses to build the infrastructure, lay the electricity to do whatever, Wi-Fi, all the stuff that has been done in the last hundred years, 80 years. And then instead of again, taxing and appropriately spending here, they just continue to get off the dot, get off the gold standard eventually, get off all standards eventually, just print money whenever they want, pay to use to pay for all the wars and imperialism that they want. And then they can get that paid for, not through our taxes in a responsible way, as, as, as you know, mainstream economists would say, but through making other countries pay for that debt by buying up our businesses, paying for our business, buying our products, buying, buying what the U.S. produces, uh, um, uh, having U.S. companies set up their infrastructure. In other words, as King was saying here, open up overseas markets to absorb U.S. economic surplus. You got, you got products that need to be bought. You got capital that needs to be developed and invested in a global military imperial context. How are you going to pay for it? You make other countries pay for it. You make them buy your products. You make them use your dollar to buy their products. You make them use your dollar to buy products your companies are making and then selling to those countries. You make them use, get on the U.S. dollar and then use that U.S. dollar to hire American companies to create the infrastructure that you're telling them that they have to invest in. Now, that part gets left out by the cryptologists who just assume that the devaluing dollar is going to get replaced by this new currency and leave out the diplomacy, the military, the imperialism that is behind all of it. Anyway, so as they continue here, right on time. Capital accumulation requires real armies commanding and super and, and supervising market relations on a global scale. That's the other part that they leave out of Hudson's point. That at the end of all of that are the real armies. You could have your digital currency or your even your fake fiat currency. It doesn't matter because if it's not backed by a real army, it ain't gonna be adopted. It ain't gonna be, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't. And if it is. Uh, imposed by a real army, it's doing what all currency is meant to do. Manage social relations for an empire. The British didn't make the Kenyans adopt the pound because to make the pound have value so that they could invest in it and make money. They made, no, they used the pound to make, to, to develop a social relationship with the Kenyans. backed by the military that came in, took the land, took the products and said, if you want the land and the products, you have to pay us in a pound. How do you get the pound to pay us in? Well, you go to work for us and we'll pay you the pound that you then give back to us for access to the land and the resources that we've taken from you. 
Certainly the conscription, the conscription, criminalization and disposability of poor idle surplus labor, the historical process of forcibly divorcing the producers from the means of production that for Marx's capitalism's precondition has always relied upon racial differentiation as a directly as a directly violent yet so also flexible and fungible mode of, a, of, a, of ascription, end quote. But as continuing quoting Nikhil Pal Singh, goes on to point out there has been no period in which racial domination has not been woven into the management of capitalist society. So King spoke of expanded social and productive capacity under capitalism, population increase and improved living conditions, but he also underscored as the precondition their dialectical underside, the production of human scrap, the disposability of living labor and the omnipresent threat of systemic, systematic annihilation of a people. Here we, we would do well to recall uh, to quote Singh again, that the, the quote, constant violent dislocation of these two processes requires constant management in the form of police and military solutions. That is directly coercive in, in, in that is directly coercive interventions, end quote. The only thing I think that they leave out here that I think Marx, King, uh, uh, um, uh, Nikhil, Nikhil Paul Singh, to the extent that I've read the work, what I think they always leave out in this formulation is in addition to uh, uh, the police and military solutions as part of coercive interventions is the propaganda and the psychological warfare. And I would, I think actually that is number one, even above police and military is the psychological warfare. It's the, it's the laying of the groundwork of a level of consciousness that will, that I think we're still struggling with that. I think that that gets left out of that particular formulation, but here back to the authors here. These sobering considerations can be read back into King's suspicions of global capitalism in richly generative ways. The imperial expansion of the capitalist value form has put more and more human beings in relation to, to one another in ways that feed the production and circulation of capital. As Samir Amin re reminds us, Far from progressively homogenizing economic conditions on a planetary scale, this historical process has produced a racially in, has produced racial inequality and uneven geographical development, a permanent a, a permanent asymmetry, in which is affirmed with violence still greater than that co contemplated by Marx, the law of pauperization that is indissolubly linked to the logic of capital accumulation. This is precisely what has become of the inescapable network of mutu mutuality that will remain, what will remain of it, King feared, unless enough conscientious objectors step up to confront actively and politically, and not merely through the cultivation of moral conscience or righteous or right perception, the war making and imperial offensive that reproduce the conditions for the production and circulation of value worldwide. In other words, as I'm reducing it to, until people get serious about the business of assuming political power, organizing social movements that assume political power, all we're going to do is reproduce the conditions for the production and circulation of value worldwide and value based on the war making and imperial offensives of, of capital. It is important to note that King's anti-war arguments are were carved against a burgeoning mid-century Black internationalism at a time when he found himself immersed in what Brandon Terry has called the problem space of Black power. This was a context in which a resurgence of Marxist thought in Black political life helped enable a shift away from the discourse of inclusion and citizenship rights toward emphases of oppression on oppression and domination. Do we not need that right now? You could say you could give credit to Marx or someone else if you want or some, uh, something else if you want, but we definitely could benefit if it's not from a resurgence of Marxist thought in black political life, but something that will help, help us shift away from what is overbearingly right now, uh, 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 um, a discourse of inclusion and citizenship rights or inclusion into the cryptocurrency utopia. King's second phase marked his reorientation toward criticism of structures of oppression and domination. And it could be argued that this context enabled his pan-Africanism in compelling ways too. As Terry goes on to point out, King often invoked African-Americans' connections to Africa and suggested modes of transnational solidarity. 
and 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 let me just enlarge my screen for for the moment because what did I put in the margins in my notes? Soda. So all these backwards hashtaggers wanting to claim king again. All these black capitalists wanting to claim king. Do not read King. They intentionally or willfully or just simply ignorantly misquote and abuse and misrepresent King. King often invoked African-Americans connections to Africa and suggested modes of transnational, transnational solidarity. And what does SOTA stand for? Solidarity of dispersed Africans. My mic is on a stand, otherwise I drop it. <laughs> King urged solidarity with grassroots struggles of various kinds all over the globe been a revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, he said, and out of the wounds of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. He said to support these revolutions. Mm. Joshua Clover has argued that the riot, rather the traditional labor strike, uh, Rather than, rather than, let me, let me, let me come back to that. Let me, hold on a second. King was tempted to move out of his nonviolent comfort zone in an effort to grapple with modes of indigenous protest against the coming of an, of the new phase of the capitalist economy, what critics refer today to today as the neoliberal world order. Joshua Clover has argued that the riot, rather than the traditional labor strike, is the mode of anti-capitalist protest that follows organically from the lived realities of a post-production phase, a moment marked by a glaring coupling of surplus capital and surplus population. Hmm. I put a question mark here. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if I understand that or agree. Whether the industrial labor strike is a form of collective action that struggles to set the price of labor power, is unified by worker identity and unfolds in the context of production, riot struggles to set prices in the market, is unified by shared dispossession and unfolds in the context of consumption. The riot, Clover says, is a circulation struggle because both capital and its dispossessed have been driven to seek reproduction there. It is worth noting that King in the last year of his life became far more ambivalent about riotous protest than his sanitized legacy has been made to lead on. So that's interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting. The riot, rather than the transnational labor strike, is the mode of anti-capitalist protest that follows organically from the lived realities of a post-production phase. Whereas the industrial labor strike is a form of collective action that struggles to set the price of labor power, is unified by worker identity, and unfolds in the context of production, Riot struggles to set prices in the market, is unified by shared dispossession, and unfolds in the context of consumption. Hmm. Surplus population confronted by the old problem of consumption without direct access to wage. Indeed, for King, the riot was an indigenous reaction on the part of the surplus population confronted by the old problem of consumption without direct access to wage. Whereas, quote, the American economy in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries had room for even a great need for unskilled manual labor, whereas once jobs were available for willing workers, the 1968 King said, quote, there are fewer and fewer jobs for the culturally and, and, culturally and educationally deprived. Thus does present day poverty feed upon itself. The Negro cannot escape his ghetto. But as we discuss more fully in the next chapter, King's arguments for the recovery of a more robust state-sponsored social welfare contract are not anachronistic. So this is where I'm ending uh, my, my, my presentation and work with this book today. But I, I want to come back to it at some point because I, I, I do want to get more into what, what um, King's politics were at the end of his life, particularly around this argument that we need state-sponsored social welfare. welfare. Uh, and that this was not an, an anachronistic argument of the time. 
Um, King knew as well as any trained economist that markets coordinate human pre preferences. But by the time he called for the mass mobilization of poor people, he must have concluded that markets simply do not see poor people because the poor have nothing to offer and cannot be fitted into their mode of valuation. In the new economy, if the new economy is fraught with accumulation crises and is moving towards a zero sum relation between winners and losers, then we ought to expect a new era of politicization. We ought to expect that future resistance, disillusioned as was the later king, will set out to work both within and beyond conventional channels of liberal democracy. Let's hope so, because unlike what Reggie Middleton argued in our debate and other cryptologists have been arguing uh, 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 against me in, in, their, in their claim that Bitcoin can produce limitless wealth and that it is not a zero sum game, which I, I still don't see how they make that argument because how can wealth be defined against unless it's against an absence of wealth? Uh, anyway, uh, I hope we get something that, that, that moves us beyond conventional channels of liberal democracy. The, the, the mature king knew all too well that some Americans would need to give up privileges and resources for others to live in decency. And he knew all too well that, quote, that took politics, end quote. Can't just get our money right. We need to be politically organized because we can't get our money right unless we're politically organized. Um, fascinating stuff. So uh, anyway, as King said, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today is his own government. My favorite part also here to always remind folks that it, uh, shortly before his death, he was increasing his um, uh, critique of the black middle class, which is again why I think that the backwards hashtaggers and the cryptologists and others are are resistant to his argument. Uh, because Dr. King would not have just been supporting a few black people making some money in Bitcoin and claiming that's the revolution. He, in fact, he's saying to the black bourgeoisie, "You cannot be a conscientious a conscientious objector in the war against poverty." Everybody's got to get involved. And then towards the end, less than 90 days before he was assassinated, uh, February 19th, 1968, the Washington Post points out uh, that fear is growing among top officials in the White House and Justice Department that Dr. King's March of the Poor will be a stunning victory for Stokely Carmichael, uh, um, another of those listed by in the COINTELPRO papers, and that he was that that was King was increasingly being taken over by the Communist Party and associating with the politics of Lenin, V.I. Lenin, that is. Now, what what Douglas and Loggins point to in their work and that I uh, would, was am pointing to in this presentation, just as a reminder, is that King was not advocating for simple, riotous, uh, uh, uproarious activities. He was talking about sustained levels of organization and direct action, permanent encampments, uh, in front of the White House and on the on the 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 mall in Washington to permanently interrupt the machine. Uh, and as I said, coming back to his assassination, just uh, just as a reminder here that Merrill McCullough the first was the first to King's body, and then he pointly he's the one that first got everybody pointing in the wrong direction, uh, away from the bushes where the shot came from. And that he, at the time he was an undercover Memphis police officer, agent provocateur, and would later join the CIA in 1974. Um, I have links to the more complete presentation on, on King and the press that I've done, M Malcolm Martin and King and others in the show notes. I encourage people to check that out um, as well. But uh, uh, just wanted to... Uh, remind folks of that point. I do want to come back one, before we get out of here. And I know I've gone really long today, but, and I, and I appreciate people sticking around or coming through or whatever, but there's another piece of this millennial millennials are killing capitalism interview with the authors of the book I've been talking about this morning. Uh, that is really, really good. It's, it, I think all of Matt capitalism stuff is really good actually, but this one is, is, is particularly, particularly fascinating for me. And I just want to play this little clip uh get it to stop right there stop right there stop right there 
that talks about Dr. King and his approach to the dialectics. Oh, I'm sorry, would you put up there, Jad? Black Power Media is a slide presentation, is something used for class. Yes, Ricky, yes, yes, uh, all of that. Um, and in fact, I'll double check in a second, but the show notes, I think, have a link to some of that. But these are presentations that I can share or are downloadable. Um, uh, been doing a version of it for a, a, for years. So there's there's a couple versions. There's a bad Prezi that I tried to do some years ago. I, the content's really good, but the, the aesthetics of it are, are, are not. Um, but I'll make all that available, uh, uh, if I haven't already in the show notes, uh, or, or else where people can just email me if they want it. Um, but let me just play this little clip of, of them talking about King and the dialectics here. Inclusion of values is something that appears very prominently in, in his 1967 anti-Vietnam War speech, for example, but, you know, it's a refrain that he comes back to again and again. We need to get on the right side of the world revolution and undergo a radical revolution of values, that is not something that can be done simply by changing our perception, by cultivating the right kinds of values, by you know, treating our neighbor with respect and kindness and whatever, when we participate in this world capitalist system that reproduces as a matter of course, you know, the devaluation of black life and inequality. And you know, what we're trying to argue is that King was, was really attuned to all of that and understood that you can't just get it values by saying you're gonna get it values that you really have to transform the whole structure. So from King's own writings and speeches, specifically a couple of those chronicled in The Radical King, but also you, you referenced this throughout your text with him as well. Um, it's clear that he had a significant interest in dialectical thinking, that you know he cites Hegel as, as a major influence on him. And he nevertheless is dismissive of Marx and of dialectical materialism, you know, which we'll get to in a second. There's also ways in which he does find certain things in Marx valuable and useful as well. But talk a little bit about his relationship to dialectical thinking, you know, first, and, and how you see King's dialectical thought at work. What similarities does it have to other dialectical thinkers? And you know, what are some of the things that you found unique in looking at him in this way? Yeah, thank you for this question. This is fantastic. This is, you know, we've done a couple of book events now, but haven't had a chance to talk about King as a dialectical thinker. And so this is really welcome. But, you know, it is difficult to talk about, you know, Hegel and dialectical logic and all this sort of stuff. And so I'll just try to make a couple of points. You know, of course, King famously identified Hegel as his favorite philosopher. You know, he led a study group at one point. It was known as the Dialectical Society. He really, you know, seemed to have developed an appreciation for dialectical logic and, and dialectical inquiry. And, you know, there are two aspects of this that King was drawn to. One is an emphasis on tension or contradiction, right? But, you know, more loosely tension, what we might think of as sort of fraught relations between parts within larger totalities. And, you know, what King often referred to as creative struggle is said to drive change. It drives movement. It drives our psychic and material growth. And, and you know, certainly the most prominent expression of this in King's work is, is the 1963 letter from Birmingham Jail, where he says, you know, famously that he's not afraid of a little tension, whether between thoughts in one's mind or between factions within society, that, you know, tension is, is precisely the point. And, you know, this initial emphasis on tension gives way to another idea that's you know, integral to the modern dialectical tradition, which is that these fraught relations are circumscribed by an overarching commitment to rational synthesis. You know, King was convinced that tensions would be and should be moved to reconciliation. And he described his philosophical method as grounded in a presumption of what he called rational coherence. And I should just note that all of this is part of a chapter on King's methodology. And we understand that not in a scholarly sense, but in the sense of a kind of public reasoning. We're trying to you know, think about how we build a black radical counterpublic and what modes of critical inquiry are needed and what sort of approach is most helpful in you know, assessing conditions and making sense of lived experience. And not necessarily from you know, sort of the lofty vantage of you know, the ivory tower or wherever, but you know, on the part of folks on the ground, you know, how might we get together with others and exchange reasons for why we think and behave in the way that we do, and we see all this, this kind of public reasoning is, is really integral to, to movement building, to the building of a black radical counterpublic. 
And so this is kind of the context in which we're thinking about King as a dialectical thinker and what it means to think dialectically. And, you know, when we think dialectically, the tensions we experience over time are to be sharpened, as Hegel famously put it, into contradictions. So those tensions we experience, we sharpen them in our minds into contradictions and and sort of bring them before our consciousness as such. And contradictions are said to provoke movement growth, you know, struggle, our active, you know, contestation of the values and norms of our lived reality, precisely because these contradictions are held to be irrational and therefore unappealing and unsustainable, right? I mean, certainly we could live in contradiction continuously, but part of the point of sort of bringing a dialectical mode of inquiry to our sense-making is to bring a kind of normative energy that is averse to contradiction, right? This principle of non-contradiction that drives us to identify these contradictions and then work to overcome them because they they shouldn't be sustained, right? And, you know, for King and, and others in the dialectical tradition, it's this notion of rational coherence or synthesis, this commitment to a principle of non-contradiction that orients us critically toward the tensions we experience and that and compels us to, you know, kind of put in the work to overcome them. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot here about sort of enlightenment rationalism and, you know, Hegel's sort of, you know, end of history, teleology, closed dialectic and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, we don't really get into too much of that in the book. I mean, the point we're trying to make here is just that this promise of reconciliation is what keeps alive the suspicion and skepticism of the present state of things. You know, for King, it's what teases along our negative judgment of the extant world order. This negative critique of the present is conditioned and borne along by a kind of driving, you know, faith in a speculative beyond, right? A world to come that sort of overcomes these contradictions is, you know, and you know, C.L.R. James once put it that, it that it's the unbearable nature of contradiction that creates negativity. I just think all that is fascinating. Sorry about that. I don't pretend to understand all of it, uh, but but um, I just think it's fascinating. I I've, I don't fully understand. I thought I've understood the difference between, of course, Marx's use of the dialectics and Hegel's, and of course, preferred Marx's because it focused specifically, as I, as I remember and understand it, on the issues of power. But Anyway, I just think it, I just think it's I just think it's fast. I just wanted to play that clip, not because I have anything particular to add to it, but just that I just I just enjoy that discussion, and I appreciate the recommendations for other uh, things to to look at. So I would I would want to know more about why King preferred Hegel's dialectics to Marx's. Anyway, that's just fast. Is, is this retrospective on MLK's politics? Uh, is this retrospective on MLK politics and to what extent they were more radical about anti-poverty and anti-war new or something that has been in the works early after King's death? Uh, I, I think I misunderstood initially the question. I'm not entirely sure if, if I understand the question, Big Teal, my, well, my point is that, that, that immediate, that, even during King's life, there was an attempt to rebrand him first as someone not to listen to. Then after he's assassinated, he's rebranded as someone he wasn't at the end of his life so that we would listen to the version that he's been rebranded to be, which is not a bad person, but certainly not nearly as radical as he was in his life. Um, and I take the work that Loggins and Douglas have done to be uh, another, you know, a, a, a fascinating contribution that, again, not only to remind us of who King really was, but for me to remind or teach me of all of the people that have been in one way or another attempting to remind us or revive the King that actually was and his wondrous radicalism. Like somebody posted on my Instagram, uh, when I posted that I was doing this, they, they, their comment was, this is the guy that integrated us into a burning house. So I, my response was, you clearly haven't read King. I mean, you just don't know. That's that's part of the unfortunate rebranding that he has suffered. So not only did he go through the transformation in his own life to become more radical, not only did he, even before that transformation, engage in some of the most 
harrowing and dangerous work, even if its goals weren't as as lofty as some of us might want, and they were just based on desegregating buses and lunch counters uh, or getting the right to vote, put them in precarious positions. But not only did he suffer that, not only did he go through the, 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 the transformation, not only did he suffer the abuse he got for going through that transformation, not only then did he get shot in the head, not only then does he die and have his whole assassination story told falsely, he's rebranded and literally carved in stone for us to look at ostensibly forever in a version that he said himself he didn't want. He said himself, don't create monuments and silly stuff like that. Do the work, to paraphrase. But we don't, so, so, um, it's bananas, it's bananas nuts. All right, so, so anyway, big respect from me to Dr. King uh, and to, to the authors, Loggins and Douglas here, to, to millennials are killing capitalism for their great interview. And of course, to Dr. King himself and all those that would continue to do that kind of work today. Um, happy birthday to him and happy uh, rebranding, reminding of the rebranding of Dr. King to us so that we can have him be the inspiration to further radicalism that we definitely need and deserve. Uh, someone who wanted, yes, he said nonviolence, but direct action in confronting uh, a, a racist capitalist empire. So he was certainly flawed, incomplete, uh, but he was targeted and assassinated and then rebranded because of the threat he represented. So I just want to pay tribute to that. And hopefully that that helps us move forward. Uh, quick break back in just a second here at I Mix. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. So before we get out of here, and I've been here all morning, I know I've been doing a law, but I, but I appreciate you all sticking around. I want to take a quick poll because I mentioned at the beginning this thing about Tariq Nasheed. I don't want to get, I don't want the remixes to get mad at me again. I find some political value in this, but I acknowledge and admit that that that's not really what drew me to this to this particular story. Um, so 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 Josh, I don't know what, where you are in all of this. Uh, if you got time or a thought, but but what should should is does it ruin anything? Should we just have some conversation with the chat for a few minutes? Does it ruin it if I bring this up? Um. Maybe nobody cares because the conversation in the chat is so on fire. Um, Stalin's also been, I think, done poorly uh, for all that he may have gotten right or wrong. But um, Eurocentrism is material reality. It needs to be addressed and encountered through more accurate Afrocentric indigenous internationalist education. Sure. No doubt. No doubt. And I just don't think that that means we should ignore the great contributions and how they've been made into great contributions by Marx and Marxists or people using that 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 analysis. So Steve said, go ahead. <laughs> I think that's the only vote I've seen on it so far. Uh, Josh said we should stay with the engaging chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's now propaganda. This space, no, propaganda is not completely done that work in this space. Anyway. Anyway, I see I just it's 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 a one to one vote so far. Everybody I don't know, the chat is is doing it though. It's fascinating. Um so let's yeah let's let's leave King with a little purity of, of some good. You saying go ahead? I don't know. I was about to say let's leave it. We can come back and do that. Go for it. I should make Kababi here for this. <laughs> anyway, all right. Let's go ahead and do it. No disrespect. Let's go ahead and do it. 
I, you know I want to do it. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let this ride. I'm just going to share this and let it, and then, and then I got one more thing on the, <laughs> oh my God, this is so bad. How do you say was never said, beautiful black woman, I bet that bitch look better red. I just said, I don't like women with my complexion. I like light-skinned women. I want you to be lighter than me. I love African-American women, but I just don't like my skin complexion. Oh, they too tough. They too tough. Light-skinned women, we could break them down more easy. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm already black. We don't need no black bitch. If I fuck with a black bitch, we gonna have a black-ass baby. Mm. So, I ain't with that. I forgot about that language. Sad, but Sorry it's the truth. That. I've heard it many, many times. Um, and we are treated differently. A lot of Latinos don't want my kind mixed into their family because they didn't want to better the race. And better the race means more European features. Could you imagine that? So this is all just setting up what what Oh yeah. Let's go to ladies and gentlemen. Now this is not one of my typical shows, but before we get into what Tariq and Nasheed had to say. I just want to say this. See, I have daughters, dark skinned daughters. And one of my reasons for even starting this channel was because of the misinformation that some of my daughters were coming back to me with that they heard on the Internet. They had questions about things that they heard. And, I, and I'm hearing this stuff and I'm saying, no, baby, that is not true. Right. You know, my nine year old daughters coming to me asking me these things, you know, my six-year-old daughter and, and I'm hearing this stuff and it's for this specific reason this information that these guys fresh and fit said you know making certain assertions and not just them but certain assertions about dark-skinned women and dark-skinned dark-skinned people I mean I mean listen it's things like this that need to be checked and checked. So remember hard. that I keep saying we're in an era where everything can be discussed. Some old clip people have circulated about these guys, but it's where they're talking about black women and how they don't hate for. black women and all this. Now listen to these dudes. So you can see where the hatred and the contempt comes from. This is some, yeah, this is some real contempt. And it's not, I don't think it's just hatred for black women. This is FBA contempt. This is contempt for foundation of Black Americans. Period. People got to understand that part of the game. Listen, like a black day to have called black. It's funny I never used that one, bro. But hey, man. So just real quick, just real quick. So this is this is what I keep saying is part of these. The, this actually was. This is actually the fault. I blame this on the crypto stuff. It's the crypto black hole or rabbit hole that I went down that led me to these fresh and fit fools, and 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 this nonsense that they espouse, which is complete garbage. And they have half a million YouTube subscribers. But it's the, it's the, it's the Tariq Nasheed critique that I find to be both humorous and a huge problem because he's already, it's already becomes an anti-Pan-African thing because fresh and fit who they are. So anyway, uh um so that's my point so the 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 trauma of the the horrors of this are one thing but i do acknowledge that that the the if there's political value to be made it's in the way we need to be more organized and and and, and projecting our response and criticisms of these issues because this is what's happening in our absence <laughs> I mean, hey, bro, if you want to date a bunch of Shaniquas, go for it, man. LaQuisha? Uh, yeah. Like, you, uh, me and Fresh aren't really down with the brown like nah, that. Man. We ain't Night Riders. Nah, so, bro, I'm good. Uh, you know, sometimes if they're, you know, red bone, but like in general, me and Fresh uh, don't dabble in the dark, if you know what I'm saying. Yep. Uh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, this Myron dude. Oh, yeah. We don't date. Yeah. We ain't down with the brown. And, oh, man. So, this guy, he's a super cool. Sitting up here talking all that bullshit because this Myron dude, this Myron guy, let's be very clear. This Myron dude, his name is not really Myron. Yeah, his his co-host is Walter Weeks. He's from Barbados, but this Myron guy, his name is not Myron. This is the Myron guy right here. 
they, a lot of people have been digging up information on this guy. This is an Arab. He's he's from the Sudan. His name is actually Amro Fudul. He changed his name to Myron Gaines, to, I guess, to try to sound more black. This is the definition of tethering. This dude is an Arab. This dude is an Arab. He comes around us trying to blend in with all of this anti-FBA hatred. From what I understand, he was also a federal agent from what people are saying. I think they said he worked with the Department of Homeland Security, something like that. But this is one of these anti-FBA testers who sit up here hating on foundational Black Americans. That's what this thing is really about. It's really about all of foundational Black Americans, and the softest target is a Black woman. You see, they can pull that bullshit on a sister because he knows you can't talk that shit around no real FBA brother. You talking all that old weak sucker shit because a nigga pop you in your damn mouth. <laughs> you understand? And he knows that. See, they try to go for what they think are soft targets. They'll try to get around sisters and try to buck up and talk all tough and talk all greasy around some sisters because they know they can't talk that shit around some of these FBA brothers, especially certified ones. Because you'll slap a falafel out of his fucking mouth. He knows that. And a lot of these dudes... That is funny to me, They though. try to... Oh, get into the manosphere type of thing. Black Sorry, everybody. My bad. Again, so so remember, T Tariq Nasheed, uh, and I believe they took this to the level of trademark law. Uh, he had his beef with the, with the hashtaggers uh, over, over trademarking uh, ADOS. And I think that's what led to the foundational Black American uh, uh, piece. So, so that's that's what he's talking about there. Yeah, yeah. They're trying to give relationship advice and all that, and it's coming from a real weird place. Yeah, that's Tariq. It's coming from a real yeah, yeah. weird, hateful ass place. You see, a lot of these dudes got my old books because, again, my books, the Art of Mackin and the Mac Within, and all these books that kicked off that <laughs> that's whole. That's the other part of this that's so funny. Thing, all. Of Oh my God. I'm sorry, y'all. This is, I know, look, 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 look. But that's what's so wild. Like all of his early books about Mackin and picking up women, he's, he's, I think, rightly criticizing Fresh and Fit in them for just stealing, you know, that kind of basic information, if it's called information about how to Mac on women. And then they put it on their YouTube shows and make it part of their content and make all this money and get all this attention. So I know, I think Tariq is mad about that justifiably, but Tariq is reminding his own origins in this. Where his claim to fame originates before the, the um, you know, where he rebranded black, uh, all that, all that African-centered history as his own project. Uh, what is it called? Hidden Colors. <laughs> All of that happened. My book was, the, my books, plural, were the genesis for all that. But my book was coming from a playing place. My books were coming from a cool place. That's why a lot of women like my books. It wasn't the He-Man Woman Haters Club bullshit. You understand? My books were coming from a very genuine place. And I even wrote many books for women, too. But these dudes, it's it's coming from a simp place where they want to just almost punish women to a certain degree. It's always some old simpy ass bullshit. You, you know what I'm saying? It's some real bit. whiny, we got to get over type of shit. It's real cornballish. It's real corny. I'm talking about simps like these dudes right here. It's it's a real simpish ass, and energy. they are corny because the game got to be in you. The game it got to be in you, not on you. And all of this stuff these niggas talking about, yeah, I don't date the brown and all that. Let's be very clear. That, those are coping mechanisms. Let's let's be very clear. All right, that, dudes, was, that, that was it. 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 That's enough. But 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 uh uh. Like, I agree with him on that. And I say this is a corny dude. I say this is a dude who has and had no game. I say this is a dude who didn't Mac on anybody, that didn't have a whole Rolodex of numbers. I say that it's all of that. The only thing that kept me from full, complete, goofy nerddom is 
a 435 pound bench press and a 4840 and a 6'2 frame. That's it. Inside of all of that was Dungeons and Dragons, comics, video games, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, I'm going to stand off in the corner and admire the woman that I like, but not, you know, be hollering at her and all, but, you know, like that was me. So I get it. So I know corny, but those dudes, they are corny. Fresh and fit are wholly corny. And so anyway, but my point, of, what, 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 anyway, it was crypto that dragged me down into the fresh and fit. But when I saw this, because there's another response to this that honestly, I can't, I, that honestly goes too far. I won't bring onto this platform. There's another one of these Tariq types that I don't want to even bring into this because because of his associated behavior beyond this is 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 for me and members of this platform and and, and going too far. So we're not even going to go there. But for with Tariq, he's an example of what I'm saying is a problem. Like like fresh and fit are a problem. There's, it's a it's a Sudanese dude and a dude from Barbados, and they they. All of the stuff. They don't like black women. They don't like women, period. They don't treat people. They have bad advice. They're, 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 everything I've seen is just a mess. But to turn that into an anti-Pan-African argument and to use that as Tariq does to support why uh, we need this foundational black American analysis that, again, contradicts King and everybody else, all the other greats of the politicals, whatever political stripe that we need to abandon all of that because these folks over there don't like us. So now granted what I'm about to show you is from 2007. So we all want to give people room to grow, but I can't help the, the contradiction being this evident because this was a video sent to me after I shared the video we were just watching uh, from 2007, Tariq Nasheed in Brazil. It's a it's a self taken video from Tariq Nasheed on a trip to Brazil. So while he's talking about, at least now, he has evolved an analysis that the black world outside of the united states is opposed to black americans this is his trip to brazil and apparently what he got out of that trip and how he sought to engage women from the other uh, you know other parts of the diaspora and in brazil and we do know that there was a, a point i remember it popping off big in the early 2000s it may still be going on but of black men going to brazil that became like the hot thing in fact, uh, you know, uh, 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 one of my college buddies was big into it. Uh, took regular trips to Brazil to create videos similar to the one we were just looking at there. But yeah, you can see the full video at maclessons.com. But that that is that is Tariq. And I, I, where was the part where he shows up? Yeah, there he is, right there. And you know, in his in an early selfie, uh, you know. So, I mean, I can't help but I, I know it's I, I know it's petty, but I but, I, you know, and I thought it was funny that, you know, that this was sent to me. But this is this is sort of what I'm saying. Now, we all have contradictions. Dr. King, me, everybody has had the contradictions. All the people we talk about have the contradictions. So that's not to say you can't grow and all that. But I think it's just interesting that that that, uh, you know, I don't hear that part being addressed. I don't even hear that being referenced in his reflections on his growth. That you know, yeah, I used to do what these brothers are doing to 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 black women from here to other women from other sea overseas, but you know, I've grown and they maybe can grow too. No, he uses this specifically to continue to carve out this lane of FBA, uh, um, which I'm sure is good for his YouTube numbers and and maybe uh, uh, you know donations. Uh, but but it's 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 a political lane that takes us again away from where, where we should be going in the politics of, of Dr. King um, and many others and is and poses as radical critique of the nonsense that does deserve to be critiqued. So that's where I think we are. I think, uh, I thought, I think Ricky had the, the point earlier. This just shows how much more work we have to do. Uh, um, no, I agree with you. I, I, I'm not saying I just wanted to leave it out that there could have been an advance since 2007. 
Um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's it's crazy. So that's why, anyway, I you know, admittedly, I'd like to have some petty fun with it, but the reality is that this is just a reminder of, that, of the kind of work that we need to do, so. Uh, yeah, the grift is strong. You all got that right. Um, he said Brazilians were better than FBA back then. Maybe, I mean, you know, maybe, so. Anyway, listen, look, I really appreciate you all sticking around and hanging out this morning. Uh, big thanks to Josh and Aaliyah who are supporting the program and the platform behind the scenes. Uh, definitely big shout out to Andrew Douglas and Jared Loggins for this work that that I'm going to continue to work through. Big shout out to, to uh, the, the, the good people at Millennials Are Killing Capitalism in that podcast, all of which should be linked in the chat below. I mean, in the show notes below. Uh, so, so thanks to everybody, uh, for, for checking that out as well. Please tweet this out, share it, invite people to check it out later on, uh, send your critique, you know, uh, uh, to me directly, or I, since I do check them all the time, do like my man Pierre over at Comedy Hype suggests and put any of your thoughts. Put it in the comments. And we'll get to it, uh, as soon as I can. Anyway. Big shout out everybody. Enjoy the rest of your holiday. Big rest in peace and power to Dr. King and to the politics he actually tried to represent at the end of his life. Let's pick them up and advance them and make them more militantly organized. Uh, peace to you, as Fred Hampton used to say, because I know you're willing to fight for it. And we'll be back tomorrow morning with the full Remix Morning Show crew for your boom bat breakfast then. Peace, everybody. Thanks again. Much appreciated. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What I like, what I like.